will make one of the biggest decisions of their lives. Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Nigel Farage, and this is GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm back again. It's Saturday night and this is the Saturday Five. I'm Darren Grimes along with Albie Ammon Corner, <laughs> Diane Spencer, Charlie Rowley and Benjamin Butterworth. Tonight on the show... Israel-Palestine protests. What's the point? No one's listening. Easter eggs. Should you eat the whole egg? I think you shouldn't. M a Christian refugee with a Muslim funeral. Our asylum system is in pieces. I think it's now time that parents pay the price for their unruly kids. And we need to get rid of the Dickensian housing system the Tories are defending. It's 6pm and this is the Saturday Five. Welcome to the Saturday Five. We have a three-hour Easter extravaganza for you this evening. And on the day of the historic Oxford v Cambridge boat race, I'm joined on board the good ship Saturday Five by a very safe pair of hands in the shape of first mate Albie Amancona, Charlie Rowley as a former Tory advisor, so he should know what to do with himself on a sinking ship. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and brilliant comedian Diane Spencer will keep us laughing all the way into harbour. As for Benjamin Butterworth, let's hope it's a case of man overboard before we reach <laughs> that. Yeah. Of course, we want your views as well. Please get in touch by emailing gbviews at gbnews.com, much more important than ours. And roll up, roll up, get your questions in for Ask the Five. You can put one of us on the spot about any topic you like. But before we get into that, it's your Saturday Night News with Polly Middlehurst. Thanks very much indeed, and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom tonight is that the nationalities of migrants who commit crimes could be posted in a new league table, with ministers saying it'll give the government more power to tighten immigration laws. A group of Tory MPs wants to see statistics on every offender convicted in England and Wales published every year, and they say the rules will help the Home Office impose stricter visa and deportation policies for individuals from certain countries. The former immigration 
Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick is behind the idea and speaking exclusively to GB News earlier on today, he said the public wants to know what impact arrivals to the UK are having on the country. I want the most honest and transparent debate about immigration, legal or illegal, that we can possibly have. And it is wrong that the government or other agencies hide statistics. I have laid an amendment to the upcoming Criminal Justice Bill, which tackles one of these issues, and it says that the government must publish statistics on crimes and sentences by country of origin and by visa and asylum status. I think that the public want to know who's coming into our country and what the economic, the fiscal and the societal impact of immigration is. Robert Jenrick speaking there. Well, almost 5,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel so far this year, with Border Force officials escorting around 300 illegal migrants onto Dover after intercepting them today. The Home Office says their French counterparts are facing growing dangers as they attempt to intervene, with police there saying they're experiencing higher levels of violence and disruption on the northern shores of France. The interim DUP leader, Gavin Robinson, has told colleagues the party isn't about any one individual, saying instead it exists to build a better and stronger Northern Ireland. It follows the resignation of Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, who's been charged with historical sex offences. The Police Service of Northern Ireland has since warned against speculation on social media, saying anything that leads to the identification of a victim is a crime and will be treated as such. It's understood Sir Geoffrey's told DUP officers he'll strenuously contest allegations against him. Counter-terrorism police are investigating the stabbing of an exiled Iranian journalist in southwest London. Puria Zarati, who was targeted outside his home in Wimbledon, is said to be in a stable condition in hospital after suffering an injury to his leg. The London-based television channel Iran International says the attack follows Tehran's plot to kill two of its presenters in 2022. It's calling for stronger action against the regime. Police here say they're keeping an open mind regarding any motive. Two security sources have accused Israel of striking a car carrying UN observers in southern Lebanon. The UN peacekeeping mission says four people were injured. The Israeli military has denied any involvement. Meanwhile, further aid airdrops have been carried out over Gaza. The US military says it's conducted 18 such missions this month. And yesterday, the UK dropped more than 10 tonnes of food and humanitarian supplies, including rice, flour, tinned goods and water, to help civilians affected by the ongoing conflict. Here in the UK, household budgets are about to be hit by much bigger bills. A range of services and products, including broadband, mobile phones, TV licences and stamps, are going up from Monday. The average annual council tax bill is also increasing by about £100. And water and sewerage charges in England and Wales are also rising by about £27 a year. It isn't all bad news, though. National insurance is going down, along with energy bills falling to their lowest for two years. Classic Magnum ice creams are being recalled over fears they may contain metal. Manufacturer Unilever says the precautionary measure follows internal safety checks and products sold in packs of three are now being recalled with the warning linked to five batches, all showing a best before date of the 25th of November. The company has apologised to consumers and says no other Magnum products are affected. And lastly, the rowing team Cambridge has claimed a double victory with the men and women winning the historic boat race on the Thames today. The rowers had to ignore tradition, though. They were warned not to jump into the water to celebrate after winning their events because of the high levels of E. coli that have been detected in the river. They were also advised to cover up any cuts with waterproof plasters and to try to avoid accidentally swallowing river water. The men claimed their fifth trophy in six years, while the women cruised to a seventh straight victory. And just lastly, summer is one step closer with the clocks going forward tonight. The bad news is you'll lose an hour of sleep with the time shifting forwards at about one o'clock. The good news is it signals the beginning of British summertime. That means longer evenings and brighter days ahead. And 
one hour less rain, of course. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. It's Saturday night and you're with the Saturday Five. I'm Darren Grimes and I can promise that you're in for a very lively hour. As well as all of our regular features, we'll be going across the pond to get all the latest showbiz news. We'll be asking if TV comedy is dead. I know a lot of you think that. And roving reporter Albie Amancona has been out and about today meeting the boat race spectators. I can't think what drew him to that particular race in particular. <laughs> but before all that, let's crack on with tonight's first debate. Who's going to lead us off? It's me. I'm going to be leading us off, Darren. So it's been six months since the awful October the 7th terrorist attacks in Israel. And almost every weekend we've seen protests on the streets of London and other major cities across the United Kingdom for the causes of Israel and Palestine. But I'm asking today, what's the point? Because no one appears to be listening. Hamas are still at large, and Netanyahu's regime continues their attack on the Palestinian people. So the question that I'm asking is, is it time for these protests to end? Because it doesn't seem that any of the key political players, whether or not they're here in the US or indeed in Israel and Palestine, are listening to what people are saying on the streets. I was walking past the, the, the demonstrations earlier on today, coming back from lunch, and I was seeing all sorts of things. Yes, lots of people were peaceful, but I did hear chants of from the river to the sea just before Jeremy Corbyn was speaking on Trafalgar Square. And I just thought to myself, would Jeremy have been at any other protest where they were singing some sort of anti-race, some sort of racist chant? I don't think so. I also saw some footage online on Twitter, formerly known as, as X, of a man who proudly supports Hamas. And I think we can bring those images to you now. The same as the French did. The same as the French did against the Germans. So what, what are you actually saying? I'm saying I fully support Hamas. They resisted the occupation. What are you saying? I'm saying I fully support Hamas. They resisted the occupation. I fully support Hamas. Don't give they up resisted the occupation. These are shameful scenes, aren't they, Darren Grimes? Is it time for the protests to be ended? Yeah, I would ban them. I definitely think, especially after what I encountered today. So I, I did a show earlier today, and one of our reporters uh, knew... Well, she's in the news area, so she's a broadcaster for our channel. And she's called Catherine Forster, who I'm sure you all know. And uh, she's a lovely woman. She got into doing this kind of work through The Spectator. Later in life, she applied for a Spectator, which is a magazine internship program. And she was out there today giving a very impartial, matter-of-fact take on the protests and what they were calling for on this particular day. And this man with a megaphone was screaming in her ear that she's a fascist and that GB News must be silenced or something to that effect. And it really shook her. The police were stood by doing absolutely nothing. Now, I find it pretty hard to countenance that a, a protest can be allowed to silence the free press. Mm. And I think that calling that man that you just highlighted there, calling for saying he supports Hamas openly, of course, as we know, a prescribed terrorist organisation in this country, I don't know how we can allow this to continue. I believe in freedom of association, freedom of expression, all the rest of it. But this has been going on week in, week out. It's cost the taxpayer tens of millions of pounds. Police resources are having to be pooled from outside of London. That's dragging away from infrastructure around the rest Absolutely. of the country. Absolutely. But, I mean, the majority of the people there were peacefully protesting. I mean, I was there. There were certainly some unsightly things which happened, and we saw that in the videos and the images that we have just seen. But if the majority of people are peaceful, peacefully protesting, Darren, is it really the job of the state to stop them? I think when, when actually you've made... It, I forget who it was that said, look, you've made your point. James Cleverly. James mm. Cleverly. And I think, actually, they have made their point. The UN, David Cameron at the UN, the Foreign Secretary, just called for and supported a UN resolution for a ceasefire. What more do they want? Yeah. The country has demanded a ceasefire. I, I have, I, and by the way, I do not support a ceasefire until the hostages are released. But that said, 
They've got what they wanted. What more do they want to extract from the British state? This is just the, them trying to spread poison on our streets, I think. Benjamin, it is a lot of people on the left who are attending these protests. Now, I know you don't necessarily share their opinion, but how do you feel about the protests being banned, given it is a lot of people on the left who are attending these protests? Well, look, I found this a really difficult one. So, in France, President Macron, who is a centre-left politician, banned the protests after one or two weeks. So there haven't been these every yeah. Saturday as there would have otherwise. Now, I don't particularly like the idea of the state being that interfering as the French state so often is. And although I think most a lot of Jewish people in London have said that they feel unsafe and they feel uncomfortable in central London. And so I think that's one of the reasons why it makes it difficult, because my instinct is that you shouldn't ban these protests. I certainly don't think the cost is a reason to ban them, because you could apply the argument to any political protest, because it costs a great deal of money for the police. Uh, but the problem is that I don't think the police are using the powers that they have at the moment. When you have that man in the clip that we just saw saying, I support Hamas, what he's doing there is a criminal offence. It's a prescribed group. It's not like saying, you know, you support, uh, you know, the Women's Institute or something, right? These are terrorists that murder Jews and rape women. And I think we'd do better for the police to enforce the laws we already Charlie, have. Charlie, mm. a sitting MP, Jeremy Corbyn, gave a speech today, and after that speech, the crowd cheered from the river to the sea. Do you think it is appropriate for a sitting MP to be giving speeches in an environment where some people would argue there's such open anti-Semitism? Would he do it if there were, if the KKK were there screaming anti-black chants, for example? It's a total disgrace. And there's absolutely no way any MP, any elected official in UK politics should be advocating uh, that kind of tone, that kind of language. Um, that is not something... I mean, you know, you'll get people that come on and interpret it in different ways. There's no interpretation, OK? Uh, it is offensive to uh, the Jewish people of this country. We've seen already another MP, Mike Freer, had his constituency office, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, a, a victim of uh, arson attack uh, because of the way in which uh, these protests are ongoing. I mean, I think time is enough. You know, time is up. You know, the protests, they do need to come to an end. They're not achieving what... Uh, uh, or they are achieving, actually. Um, or they, you, know, you, you can't just have uh, a protest on the streets of London where businesses have to close every week, where you've got you know, people like that crackpot shouting that he supports a mass. Where I never thought I'd say this, but I agree with Benjamin. You know, that man uh, is you know, committing an offence. The police should be stepping in. Get but Diane in on this. Mike Freer is an allegation. Just have to Absolutely. Put that on record. Diane, is there a free speech argument here? Should we allow them to continue in the name of free speech? Well, I mean, we need to have the ability to be able to move as one, as the public, to sort of to, to let the people know how we feel. But as you were saying, when you have people, they, they only want it one way. We need everybody to hear our idea, but we don't want GB News broadcasting any idea that is opposite to ours. Yeah. If they're not willing to play by free speech rules, maybe they shouldn't be allowed to protest. If they willingly try to silence other groups, how is that truly listening to any argument? There were both pro-Palestine and pro-Israel protesters out today. How terrified would you be as a member of the Jewish community yeah. just moving through parts of London today mm. going, oh, great, now I can't go down this way. I guess I'll have to take a, a, a round route of the blocks. Like, it's just not fair because this aggression, like you say, there were peaceful people, but there's always this nasty little small minority that seem to think it's their right to kick off and get violent. Dan, would you ban the pro-Israel protests too? Um, well, I mean, I, there haven't been every week. Have well, there were today. I saw pro-Israel protest. protests but I and think pro the, protests. But I think if protests, would you just ban the whole lot? Um, Darren wants us in lockdown. He wants all of us in lockdown. Do, We're not allowed do, to go anywhere. I do. I you do. do. I know you hate people, and that is understandable. I respect I it. Especially in London. No. <laughs> um, right, I'm going to go next now. I want to talk about the tale of Abdul Azadi, the uh, Geordie asylum seeker, as some like to say. He's, he wasn't actually a Geordie, by the way. Azadi's story, I think, highlights flaws in the asylum system and actually the misguided trust placed in it. For a bit of background, Azadi, known for... Uh, Frequent, frequenting his local halal butchers, received a Muslim burial, revealing his professed confession, or conversion rather, to Christianity as, well, a deception. The, his acid attack left a woman and her daughter with a, well, I assume, lifelong scar, overshadowing a previous sexual assault conviction in 2018, which, despite that, he got into the country. Now, 
you look at the fact that the narrative now is that Christian ministers and the judiciary are fair game to, for criticism. And I would accept that for being fooled by asylum seekers, asylum seekers, claiming conversion to Christianity. You've got other examples, like Azadi, they've got the Islamist bomber Al Sweeman. The, the judiciary, basically, the criticism of the judiciary here overlooked his criminal background. And of course, the Church of England, I think, have a real case to answer. I don't think he should have ever been allowed into the country. I think other countries do this much better than we do. And actually, I think the public deserve a hell of a lot better than what they've got. You were in government, Charlie. I mean, that's not acceptable, surely. It's to not allow someone like that in the country, I mean. No, it's not. And um, I think everybody would be flabbergasted as to know as to how to someone who had a sexual conviction against them, who applied twice to get into the UK, was rejected, rightly so, was unable to apply for a third time uh, based on having just a different religion or you know, pleading Christianity uh, and getting in. Mm. Uh, and then to go and commit that awful yes, cry, that... there he is, uh, uh, that awful crime that you just outlined, um, I think everybody across the country will be up in arms that, again, the Home Office, uh, which has got so many questions to answer, um, it's clearly not fit for purpose. It hasn't been since, I think, John Reed, the Labour you know, Home Secretary, said in 2008, the Home Office isn't fit for purpose. Uh, and so I don't think it's a government thing necessarily in total, but the Home Office certainly has to uh, look at its practices. But certainly the church has to answer the question as to why it sort of just took pity on this uh, poor fellow who, as I say, has been rejected twice and had a sexual conviction against him. But I guess the core cool question is, should we be... Pre should we provide asylum to people on religious grounds? Because ultimately, this case could happen again and again with someone just pretending to be a Christian. Now, there are parts of the world where Christians do suffer persecution and Christians may well come to this country for asylum. But just having that sort of generous, compassionate approach to asylum, saying if, if you are a Christian, you can come here and seek asylum, does that mean that we're OK with the fact that the assistant could be abused, Darren? You're a Christian. Yeah. What do you think about well, it? Well, I, I look, I, I think it's time to say that Britain can take no more. I think it's No actually, more asylum seekers no, at all? no. Because, I, I, and then I genuinely mean that, I think we've got a massive housing crisis. There is nowhere for people to go, for the native population to go. So I, I just, I think, no, I'm, I'm afraid. We can't be the end destination for everybody that wants to come here. Well, I think you can. I mean, I think, you know... Everyone. I, I, well, not everybody, obviously not everybody, but I think, you know, you can still allow people to come into the country if, they are, if they're seeking asylum on religious grounds. But just, you know, the cold, hard facts of this case is that it's not very Christian if you've already got a sexual offence, you know, or that you've already committed and you've been convicted I mean, of. So, I, you know, he shouldn't have been in the country regardless of his religion, regardless of how he was applying, on what grounds. He should not have been in mm. the country. Well, I think the person who's not a Christian here is Darren. Because the idea that you claim to profess love thy neighbour, and yet someone who has been persecuted in ways we can't even bear to comprehend, let alone experience, you that they would Abdul come Azadi to your door. I don't think that, no, but I'm talking about... That. No, I did not say that. I'm talking about asylum seekers, as you were. You weren't just talking about him. The idea that someone who has been through an utterly horrifying life experience turns up at your door and asks for help, and you think it's the Christian thing to say no, I don't want to. I tell you what, there are countries in this world that have a lot less than Britain, a lot less money, a lot less resource, sometimes less space, and they still find time to help others. And I think that's the country Britain should be. I think actually Britain should be a country that actually looks after its own people, and actually we're not doing that. You know, I, I think you, you insult the people of this the British country. People, you but insult I them. Don't. You do, because most people in this country are far kinder and far more hospitable to people no, in most hard people times think you're than what your you're views describing. On Immigration are absolutely out of the order, and no one agrees with you, frankly, if you look at the public polling. So I don't know what planet you think you're living on to think that people watching this will be in agreement with you. Who agrees that we should have no asylum seekers at all? No, I mean in the public. You, you just mentioned the public <laughs> disagree with Benjamin. I think the public would disagree with you that we should have no asylum seekers whatsoever. I mean, mm. the public was massively in favour of the Ukrainians and the Hong Kongers coming here, for example. You would say no to all of them as well. Uh, well, no, I wouldn't, actually. Not in that scenario. So changing your opinion? No, not at all, because that's well, you, not you on have. religious grounds. You didn't say religious grounds. You said you said you said no asylum seekers. So you know, to those people that came here, you, you watched this film the, the other Hong day about about, about, about the about the the Jewish immigrants during the Second World War. Yeah, we only right? had three hundred of them in. That's not I think as it was six hundred odd. But, but 
you would turn those away from people that they're escaping the persecution like that. I think that is a deeply selfish and nasty way to approach things. Do you know what? I can totally understand because I've tried to get into uh, another country and I had to change a job. Uh, I had to become a skilled migrant to get my residency in New Zealand. So you do have to change your circumstances. However, I do think it's a bit of a numpty move. Whoever stamped this guy's passport and said, yeah, no, stay. It's like he went, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, do you know what? Alan's not for me anymore. I like the Easter eggs and Jesus and Christmas. This is great. Who believed that? That's ridiculous. But the good thing is, a Muslim mate of mine said, don't worry, Allah's going to sort him out. I was like, thanks, mate. Can I just make one point? That I think he, We've got when, when he was agree. assessed on this Christianity, he actually failed the test. So clearly the system <gasps> yeah. was woefully He said, he said Jesus, Jesus was mm. Jacob or something like that. But anyway, still to come tonight, <laughs> should parents be fined if their kids go out rioting? And should you eat your Easter eggs all in one go this weekend? But next, are the Tories getting it right on housing or taking us back to a Dickensian Britain? You're with the Saturday Five, live on GB News. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Shocking new study says that vaping might be linked to cancer. Not that shocking. It found e-cigarettes can cause similar DNA changes to cells of smoking, leading experts to claim that vaping does not seem as harmless as originally billed. So joining us now is Robert Sidebottom from the UK Vaping Industry Association. Good morning, Robert. Um, is this terrible news for your industry? I imagine you're going to try and defend uh, the product still and say that there's still a lot more research to be done. Well, I don't need to really defend the product because I think actually if you read the article and you read the detail in the article, I mean, it actually starts and it states with, while this doesn't mean that vaping has the same degree of cancer risks as, as smoking does, it implies that vaping may have negative health impacts. However, we've, we've never said that vaping is completely risk-free. And we've always said that it is 95% safer than smoking, which it is. We accept that further research needs to be done. And actually, we welcome studies into the health impact of vaping, as we want to give every former smoker the full confidence that vaping is considerably safer than smoking. And that's, yeah, it, that's the important message. But that's about the former smokers. What about the young people who are taking up vaping, Robert? It's better, these, not these to vape. it's better not to vape at all, and we know why they take up smoking, because you lure them into your shops with silly flavours called bubblegum. Well, we can get into the flavour debate. That's no problem at all, because, you know, adults like flavours. I, you know, particularly I love squashy sweets. But these products, and let's be absolutely clear, are not for children. They are an age-gated mm. product that are for adults only. And, hope and that is exactly who they should be and sold hopefully, to. hopefully, um, I'm so sorry, Rob, we've run out of time, but and hopefully oh. this research will show that they certainly are not for children. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests, and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Welcome back to the Saturday Five, Fiery Start. As always, thank you very much for your emails about tonight's topics. Geordie's written in. Good evening, Geordie. She says, Israel are not attacking the Palestinian people. They are fighting Hamas, a recognised terrorist entity. The pro-Palestine slash Hamas protests have been going on for almost six months, enough already. But Keith says, Israel are committing genocide. Stop blaming protesters. GB News are the biggest bunch of fake news in this country. <laughs> it took 24 years to, of protest to free Nelson Mandela, right?
Now it's time. <laughs> uh, thanks for watching. <laughs> Who have we got next? Uh, you've got me next. So yeah. there, <laughs> there's been a big law going through Parliament about changing the rules of what renters' rights can have. And one of the main things that's been proposed is that no fault evictions, which are, as the name suggests, where a landlord can kick a tenant out without having to have any justification. They can simply get rid of them and the tenant has no rights. It's looking like that's going to be delayed for some months because landlords say that if it's passed, they're going to sell up and there won't be as many homes for people to rent. Now, the proportion of people in this country renting has gone through the roof in the last 20 years. People are renting much longer into their lives when they've started to have a family. And so I think this is a serious problem that it is Dickensian to have a law where people can be kicked out of the home that they're paying for and lose the most basic security that we have in life. What do you think of that, Darren? Look, I, I think moves that the country is going in, if you look at other parts of the country, not just England, so you've got the Tory moves, but you've also got uh, the Labour proposals and what's been proposed in Scotland, mm -hmm. which is to have a, a potential 0% cap on rents being able to rise, raise them. Now, I fear that that would mean that the marginal landlord, who isn't a massive property developer, they're not making mega bucks, would then leave the marketplace, which means that your statistic there of there being more people renting than ever before or what have you, they would be snookered because where do they go now? You've, you've just lost your landlord from the marketplace altogether because of your new regulations. So. I'm afraid it's you that's taking us back to Dickensian Britain. Well, first of all, rents have been rising much faster than inflation in general and also faster than mortgage rates have been going up. Last year, rents rose by 16% in this country. This year, they're rising at 9%. That's triple what inflation is at the moment. And so that is an enormous burden on millions of people. And I think that we underestimate the kind of social problems that extreme house prices cost. There was a story this week that we have the highest housing costs of any developed country. And what that means is that people can't have kids, they can't have stability, they can't start businesses when they want to take risks, because all that money is going into a small pot of people that own second homes to rent. And I think that causes massive problems. Well, hang on, because I think you're contradicting yourself, because at the start of the show, you were saying that I'm a heartless swine for saying that I wouldn't let in any more asylum seekers, yet you're saying, oh, our house prices are so high. What do you think's going to happen when we invite half the bloody world to our country? Well, the fact is that we haven't been building any homes. You know, we have built four million fewer homes in the last 40 years compared to equivalent European countries, right? That's a massive problem. Now, helpfully, we have someone who's advised Michael Gove, the man behind this. Do you think that delaying no-fault evictions, that these problems are because landlords are threatening not to vote Tory? Uh, no, I don't think that's, uh, that's right at all. You're absolutely right, first of all. Look, we're not building enough homes in this country, but the government has hit its target, I think, over about a million homes uh, in, in, over the course of the parliament. Uh, it's not too dissimilar to what the Labour Party are putting forward. So, you know, house building is always going to be a problem unless you get local councils, obviously, also to approve the planning application. You need to overrule in, in, in the first place. And as part of the national planning policy framework, that, I'm sure, will be, will be, uh, be coming forward at, at some stage. Um, but, you know, you can, Charlie, you can have... Can you, you seriously can... sit here and say that you are happy with the Conservatives' record on house? Housing. Look, I'm a loyal Tory, as loyal as they come. I am not happy with the Conservatives' record on housing over the last 14 years. You advised the man who is in charge of that policy. Are you seriously sitting here and saying, oh, there's nothing wrong? We hit our targets. No, of course not. There's a housing crisis, but there's been a housing crisis for the last 40 years, as Benjamin was saying. So, of course, there needs to be uh, more to, to be done to build the homes. But in terms of the renters' reform, I mean, it's making sure that you've got the protection for renters. So, instead of just having six month leases, uh, 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 three no. years, six years, you, when you start to rent a property, it becomes yours for as long as you want it to be. So, that's, that's part of the reform that's coming in. But just on the new, new for evictions, you've got to make sure, because there will be lots of landlords going through the criminal justice system, because if you want to, 
as a landlord. If you've got to evict a tenant, you've got to make sure that that is uh, as smooth a process as possible and quickly to turn around so you don't have a court's backlog on the back of no fault evictions. You've got to fix that problem first before giving full protections to renters. You know what? Down the road from me, they have just built three huge uh, blocks of flats, Good. right? I, I mean, it's great. I mean, I remember when it was just a wasteland. How big's huge? How many do you oh, know? Oh, <laughs> like at least eight floors okay. and there's four, uh, I mean, fag packet mouths, I reckon, maybe, what, 70 apartments mm -hmm. at least, right? But it's got this weird thing where you can't own it in its entirety. You have to have a shared... The, the leasehold and the shared ownership. And this is such a crime as well because the houses are being built, but the way that they're being sold is, 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 is awful because these people are then forever locked into this financial agreement with somebody and it's hard to actually sell that house. Yeah. And I think that shows the scale of the problem, that people can buy typically about 25% of the property because they don't have a chance in London of buying the whole thing. Now, all that does is fuel demand, not supply, and so it pushes prices up further. Now, I have to be honest with you, and I know some people think I hate old people, so sorry. He does. But like, I had heard. Have, I had heard. He's we been have so a rude problem. To me. <laughs> 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 we have a problem that there are so many people in this country that already own their own lovely homes, often in nice areas, and they will block anything new being developed. They would hate having that block of flats at the end of their street because they don't want their view to be disturbed. They don't want their golf club to be disturbed. They don't want, frankly, rubbish not... land that nothing's on it. And you need a government that takes away that power from local people. Right. That's the only way to resolve it. OK, mm. we'll leave that one there. Still ahead, though, <laughs> do you eat your Easter eggs all in one go? An NHS doctor has advised against it. And, of course, that's gone all, all gone down very well <laughs> with those lovable types on social media. Plus, as kids run riot in Milton Keynes, should parents be made to pay the penalty for the feral beasts that they birthed? <laughs> <laughs> You're with the Saturday Five Live on TV News. <laughs> Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Office. We're looking ahead for the rest of Easter. I think the best of the sunshine really is going to be reserved for more northern parts of the country. For the south, especially as we come into Easter Monday, it's looking very wet. So out there at the moment, we've still got low pressure in charge, and that's bringing in another band of heavy showers across more southwestern parts of the country. That will spread its way towards Northern Ireland as we end the night. Elsewhere, plenty of clear skies, so that's a perfect recipe for a fairly chilly night, a touch of frost across Scotland, with some misty low cloud just beginning to move in across parts of the east. So we do start Easter Day off on a fairly sunny note across many central parts of the country. The cloud across the east will gradually just spread its way a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather grey afternoon to come with some spots of rain. Brighter further west and especially so for Scotland and Northern Ireland here, a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures in the sunshine reaching 14 or 15 degrees. Into Easter Monday, a pretty wet picture for a lot of England and Wales. Some of the rain will be quite heavy. Could turn brighter later on down towards the southwest, but the, again, the best of the brightness will be for Scotland and Northern Ireland with a mixture of sunny spells and showers. And unfortunately, the changeable theme does look like it will continue as we head into Tuesday and also Wednesday. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics 
and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to the Saturday Five. Your emails are flying in as usual. Thank you very much for them. Mary says, you probably won't want to hear this. Oh, dear. But all the terrible troubles around the world is actually prophecies in the Bible. There is nothing we can do except to pray for the salvation of souls. Oh. We'll be on a long time with yours. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for our next debate. Who's up next? Well, I'll take this one, if that's OK, Darren, because I think your viewers might have seen in Milton Keynes the, only the other day that over 300 school kids uh, ran amok across the shopping centre. They ran riot, terrifying shoppers and shopkeepers alike, uh, where the police had to come down and issue a dispersal order. And I think it's now time, when you have these unruly kids, that the parents, who couldn't be bothered to educate their kids in a particular way, the decent standards that we all adhere to in terms of public life, I think it's now time that parents need to cough up for the bad behaviour of their feral beasts, as you put it <laughs> earlier on. And I think that's just... I just think that's the way that we need to go. We need to bring Have parents we got a into... Have to watch uh, that? Have we? There was a, a clip, was a I clip. think, earlier on, that uh, might be shown again, but I think it is just time that parents... There, there it is. 300 outsiders, all in school uniform, uh, uh, terrifying shoppers, as I said before there. Uh, and you can just imagine being in that shopping centre in Middleton Keynes just when you're doing your, your weekly shop. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I didn't think so. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know. I apologise to anyone prevented from Milton Keynes. Look, Charlie. I, I agree in principle that parents need to take more responsibility for their children. Perhaps fining parents would kick them up the backside in order for them to do that more. But I suppose the question is. If the parent is someone who can't afford to pay this fine and therefore they pay the fine and it means that they can't afford food or they can't afford their bills, what does that actually do to help the situation? It means that the child will be so tired it can't run around like a feral beast because it's had no food. <laughs> wow! Oh. Don't you work, you work. <laughs> you work <there>. Stop! <laughs> the yes, yes. I am joking, I am joking. I mean, I was a secondary school teacher and I'm telling you right now, those kids, now that they have access to social media, TikTok, they can organise their own happenings yes. as much as do they like. Do you think like. this is what's happened here? Oh, definitely. Yeah. They've all kind of got onto a little WhatsApp group and they've gone, we're going to so do it! So what would you do about that in your experience, then? Would you... Is it TikTok that's the problem? I don't think that TikTok's the problem. I think that there is... There's definitely something here. Like, that. I'm pretty sure that this would have been something that was connected uh, in cyberspace. This is something where they've all got together and, like, what was the motive? Did anybody find out why these 300 kids went nuts? Well, because they can. Yeah, yeah, but is it just because they can? Is it just because they wanted to create this whole thing and now they've been on the news, are they going to do it again? But organising but... things on social media isn't anything new. I mean, in the, in the riots in 2011, people were doing it on BBM. Now they're just doing it on WhatsApp or mm. TikTok. So I, I don't think social media is a, a new thing in no, this problem. No, but when the children use social media to organise it, like when you make a mess on social media, do we have to fine your parents? Well, this is the question. Yeah, Benjamin. I mean, and uh, what do you think about that, though, Diane? I don't think that's appropriate school? at all. You I, don't. I don't. I think that the parents are all already under enough pressure trying to raise their kids, have the job, get their kids to school, and tell you what, when those kids come back home and the parents have been watching the news and they have spotted their child, but you know what? do not think there's not going to be any mm. retaliation. Are, are those parents under that much pressure getting their kids to behave? Because it doesn't look like it's happening. You know, I would ask the question of, of how good are the parents that have the kids that are going out there behaving like this? It is Do not they really their care fault. about their kids? Are they really disciplining them? So let me because get I tell straight. you what, I would never have behaved like that mm. because I was raised by people that were strict. It just I, it mm -hmm. wouldn't have mattered. But you were raised by your grandparents, weren't you? So is it a generational thing in that maybe just parents aren't as strict as perhaps 
older generations. Wait a minute, I think most parents are perfectly that... capable. I'm just not convinced mm. that the parents of some of those kids are. And so I would also wonder, you know, would the fine do anything? Because if these are parents that aren't seriously engaging with the responsibility they have, is, is an 80 quid fine going to affect Whoa, them? you have made massive sweeping statements about the ability of these people. This is horrendous. OK, so let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. Not at one point, not at one point, with little Benjamin growing up, did he ever do anything slightly naughty? I never, never once. I never had a detention in my life. No, no, once. no, I didn't ask that. I but, didn't I mean, ask that, if you got You would get a school mate. detention I for asked something. If you did it. I didn't ask if you got found no, out. No, I mean, I was obsessively well behaved. I really was. Really? Yeah. I, I don't know what's in the water this evening, but I agree with Benjamin again. <laughs> Honestly, I do. I don't know what's come over me. I don't know what's come over me. <laughs> but I, I agree with Benjamin. These are people who should not be parents, frankly. They haven't got <gasps> their, they, they have not got the time. They clearly haven't got the ability to parent. If they cannot do the fundamentals of disciplining their child to make sure that they don't run a mock through society, that they don't go running rampage through shopping. <gasps> Centers, so that they offensive. behave badly. But these are the people, I'm sorry, these are the people that should be, uh, you know, their kids would come to your classroom as a secondary school teacher and they'd give you hell day after day as a pupil. Those parents need to be absolutely read the right act. They need to pay up you for their kids' no poor behaviour. You have no idea what these children are like. You have no idea. Terrors, obviously, terrors. They're running, they're running riots. No, it was a moment. It was a moment that they all took part in and they all went, oh, my God, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. Even the most well-behaved kid, like that one over there that just got away with it the whole time, even the most well-behaved kid, and what about the they poor... were joining in because but... it was exciting. But what about the poor pensioner, who I know uh, Benjamin loves our pensioners, yeah. obviously, but what about the poor pensioners that were going shopping just you know, peacefully that afternoon? Oh, had, had, had 300 <laughs> kids screaming and shouting, you but know, also, confronting security. Can I just point it's out a joke. That, good, but you that, can't blame the parents. I mean, one of the arguments for finding the parents is that this will have had a very real cost to the area. So there's the policing cost, there's the cost of criminal damage that's likely to have happened, there's the cost of anything was stolen from those shops, and we've seen lots of examples where you get these TikTok arranged riots. They go into shops, they steal things. Those are all costs that are being borne by other people in that community. So someone should cough up. So you agree mm. with Darren we should go into lockdown? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think with Darren we need to start need to the start change. Them. <laughs> but they were all in uniform. They were all in school uniform, weren't they? So is yeah. there not Ooh. something the school could do, like a mass detention? For example, which could maybe no, because stop them then from doing this again. You, then you've created a prison scenario. They'll all learn each other's tricks. All right, OK. <laughs> Let us know what you think at home. Still ahead, though, Lizzo and Michael Jackson. <laughs> Both feature in our showbiz <laughs> roundup with Nelson Aspen, our man in the States. And next, an NHS boss has warned us about how many Easter eggs we eat this weekend. Sensible advice or the nanny state gone mad? You're with the Saturday Five live on GB News. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. It's the first time we've had an admission from someone who at least used to be very senior yep. in the party, saying that this election is not about winning, really, for the Conservatives now, it's about mitigating the losses. There is broad recognition that this election has already been lost and that it's about damage limitation. And it is really important because it's the difference between whether, if, you know, if Labour win a slim majority, then the fight is on for the next election. I know it seems silly to look five years ahead, but it does make a difference, mm. versus basically accepting that we have 10 years of Labour government ahead. Having an acknowledgement that the Tories are going to lose, and lose badly, mm. um, disastrously, maybe, um, having that acknowledgement coming from somebody so senior is very demoralising for everybody else in the party, but also doesn't it make it then look rather immoral for them to just drag on right through to maybe November? Personally, I think Rishi Sunak should name the date now. I think he should name it for October or November. In terms of reform, if they're only four points behind the Conservatives in the latest poll, do we need to stop the narrative, which we have been using legitimately, saying, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing all right in the polls, but they won't win any seats? Do we need to change that perspective now? I think it's really difficult to say. It depends on reform's electoral strategy. There's a lot of evidence that in certain parts of the country with certain demographics, they do have a really good chance. So I think if they target seats in the red wall and other places where there's big disillusionment with the Conservatives and what they promised, I can't imagine 
that reform are at the stage where they could take uh, masses of seats. It's more about that portion of the vote that they'll be taking away that I think is going to result in that massive Labour landslide. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to the Saturday Five. As always, thank you very much for your emails. Judith's written in. Good evening, Judith. She says, why do we need so many new houses when the other issue is that the British are not having enough children? Who are the houses for and at what cost? Elizabeth says, you suggest that maybe the parents should be penalised for their children's behaviour. Of course, the answer is yes. But I get tired of hearing the words could, should, hope, might. But the end game is won't. Mm. Mm. Now it's time for our next debate. Who's going to finish off the hour? That'll be me. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Um, I'm good at finishing. So, um, <laughs> Dr Andrew Kelso uh, recently made waves because what did he do as a consultant neurologist? Uh, he wrote in a blog, an NHS blog, that, hey, guys, Easter's coming up. And you know those lovely big eggs that you like? Don't eat them all at once. Have a lovely Easter. Goodbye. And the backlash that this man has received on social media has turned the milk chocolate very sour. What I find amazing is that some people are like, hey, we've got to save the NHS, and yet they refuse to even just save the last half of the Kit Kat for later. So I've come up with a little uh, trivia question for our debate, and you can play along at home. So, gentlemen, please reveal your numbers to the cameras. Now, for everyone to see, the first part of our little... Uh, a quiz and, and you can play along at home. How many calories is in this egg? And it's one of these and it's numbers. One of these numbers. So go. I reckon it's 790. Not just because I'm holding it, because that is actually what I think. This is a hollow chocolate egg. It's completely hollow. hollow. Oh, I see Charlie's yeah. mm, Do you want yeah. to feel Sorry, the weight? 440. It's not that low. So my no. I think it's 790. I think it's 790. But if I were to go with another one, I'd say 970. Wow, so you've all gone quite... Uh, OK, brilliant. Well, can I just say, first of all, you all got it beautifully right, which is quite... <laughs> oh, good. Right. But can you guess... All right, then. Next question. So oh, you're yeah. that one. OK. How many calories is this? It's a burger with two burger patties, bacon on top and cheese. Oh, it looks delicious. I wish you'd actually brought a that's, real one in because uh, I need... That's definitely 1,500. Yeah. Yes, I reckon yeah. it's just that one. OK. Darren's one. Are we, are, we, are we ready? Are we happy? Yes. I don't even know what I've got. One, five. One it is nine. actually 400. <gasps> no. So can we now please just compare? We have the burger at yeah. 440 and the, the egg. egg at 790. <laughs> Do we still ah. think that the doctor was wrong? You're definitely a secondary school yes. teacher. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm shocked that the yes. burger is so much more calorific than this hollow egg. So less calorific, darling. It's less. Yes, sorry. Sorry. So That's less right. Calorific. A double patty as well. A double patty as well, you say. Yes. With bacon and cheese. Yes. <laughs> now, if we added the sweets, these are sugar nice sweets that came with the egg if we are added skittles? Uh, they are sweets that are available many are available oh. and um, <laughs> if they were available uh, to eat what would if you ate the egg and the oh. sweets what would we go to what 970 number? surely oh right yeah because yeah. sweets aren't actually that calorific so well, they are if you eat enough of them there's only mm. about five in there yeah. <laughs> you is can, that correct? Which means that you are left holding the daily calorie requirements of for children. a seven-year-old oh, child. So, so when we look at it, we've actually... If you ate that whole egg in one go and you're a seven-year-old child, you've eaten 
half your calorie allowance. And it's 1649 for a boy. And 1530 right. for a girl because. So where's you know, 1590 come from? Because I added them together oh, and then I came see. up with a binary <laughs> child. Oh, or a non binary, non -binary child. child. Yeah, yeah. I came up with a mystical it, child. Yeah. So there we go. <laughs> don't, get, don't get Darren Sarshan on trans children. So, <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing. I mean, I think that's a really powerful Thank way you. of pointing mm. it out. Because, of course, yes. my first instinct, having eaten an Easter egg more than just on well Easter for, that. for a long time, right, <laughs> was that, you know, it's such a normal thing, it's such a casual thing to eat. I don't really think about eating an Easter egg, certainly not this weekend. But actually, that maybe he does have a point, that that is actually an incredible amount of but sugar But it's one calories. day of the year, Benjamin mm. Butterworth. Why are we being oh. so miserable? That's almost like saying, oh, don't open your presents on Christmas because no. otherwise you won't feel thankful for anything else you get for the rest of the year. Now, I have another argument to that because of the sugar content inside I just want to chocolate. eat the egg. Now, you see, <laughs> sugar is composed, when it's granulated sugar, it's composed of 50% fructose and 50% glucose. Your liver cannot stop absorbing fructose, which means that you are more likely to get a fatty liver. Now, this We're doctor... Eating chocolate what did you call me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, because <laughs> be it honest, just keeps pumping into your system. Going on. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, is that I'm not saying don't enjoy Easter. <laughs> I'm saying make Easter last longer. Ah. Just make Easter last longer. Just have... So, like... who, can I ask a question then to the yeah. panel? Mm. Who has ever had, say, a chocolate bar, like a sort of big, bigger one, you know, and I'm not talking a little... The um, ones they ironically call sharing packs exactly. or families. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. A sharing pack of chocolate. <laughs> Who's ever had one of those and then left a little bit for later? <laughs> Never. I, I mean, know, but, yeah. but I, I know, really have the sharing packets of crisps. You know, there's massive packets of crisps and I'll just eat the whole thing. Mm. And it always says, oh, this serves five. <laughs> I finish it and I'm like, well, that's just re a really unhelpful piece of information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's because you're always running around yelling at people. Like, well, maybe that's why. I mean, you, the thing I feel is. Like you can eat what you like if you go to the gym. I think mm. one of the problems is that sugar is really addictive. Yeah. And I am definitely addicted to sugar. I get the shakes if I haven't had it. I get, yeah, I do. I, I get it really badly. I eat a I lot. I think that's the sugar. I eat a lot. That's my age. <laughs> I eat a lot of sugar. Yeah. And I find it. I did a program about a year and a half ago uh, where I went vegan, and part of it was that I came off all the sugar. Mm. Now, I literally fainted a couple of times in the first week. That was how bad my withdrawal from sugar was. Wow. But I felt fantastic a couple of weeks later. Now, eventually, I discovered fried chicken and, and chocolate again and, and returned to my old <laughs> ways. But I think. You know, sugar can really damage you, but because mm. it's such a cultural norm, we've we've kind of ignored the reality. I think we just have a lot of portion distortion. And that's what Dr Andrew Kelso was trying to point <laughs> out. He was trying to point out to us that although, like, the egg is hollow and you think it's not very much because it's hollow and it's so light, um, mm. you've got to just be aware that if you're also having breakfast, lunch and dinner and then you're giving that to a little child, no wonder there's 300 kids running through a shopping mall in Milton Keynes. Mm. If they've all had one of these, they'll be going for hours. But that's true. You, you know that eating as much sugar as you do is bad but you still do it despite the advice. So mm. what's the point in the advice if no one listens? Well, the advice All is important, right. mm. but can I just say, I get annoyed if the Easter egg doesn't have something inside it. You know, right. like okay. 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 OK, OK, I'm very careful what still, I put in my mouth. Uh, <laughs> still to come tonight, Benjamin and Albie will be going head-to-head -head on the Garrett Club. Not sure why, but doubt either of them are in contention. Next, our favourite showbiz journalist, Nelson Alston, will be here to talk about Lilo, Lilo, Lizzo, what a trio. It was the Saturday Five Live on GB News. <laughs> warm feeling inside from boxed boilers sponsors of weather on gb news Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Office. We're looking ahead for the rest of Easter. I think the best of the sunshine really is going to be reserved for more northern parts of the country. For the south, especially as we come into Easter Monday, it's looking very wet. So out there at the moment, we've still got low pressure in charge and that's bringing in another band of heavy showers across more southwestern parts of the country. That will spread its way towards Northern Ireland as we end the night. Elsewhere, plenty of clear skies, so that's a perfect recipe for a fair Fairly chilly night, a touch of frost across Scotland with some misty low cloud just beginning to move in across parts of the east. So we do start Easter Day off on a fairly sunny note across many centres.
central parts of the country. The cloud across the east will gradually just spread its way a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather grey afternoon to come with some spots of rain. Brighter further west and especially so for Scotland and Northern Ireland here, a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures in the sunshine reaching 14 or 15 degrees. Into Easter Monday, a pretty wet picture for a lot of England and Wales. Some of the rain will be quite heavy. Could turn brighter later on down towards the southwest, but the, again, the best of the brightness will be for Scotland and Northern Ireland with a mixture of sunny spells and showers. And unfortunately, the changeable theme does look like it will continue as we head into Tuesday and also Wednesday. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to GBviews at GBnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. It's Saturday night, and this is the Saturday Five. I'm Darren Grimes, along with Albie Ammon Corner, Diane Spencer, Charlie Rowley, and Benjamin Butterworth. We've got plenty more to come tonight, including a good old-fashioned Saturday scrap between old pals Albie Ammon Corner and Benjamin Butterworth. We're talking about a club they'll never get into. <laughs> it's 7 p.m., and this is the Saturday Five.
Still to come tonight, we'll head stateside. Yeehaw for the latest from the world. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on air too long. I'm like Joe Biden. I'm just <laughs> whether comedy on television is in crisis. Clearly. If you go by this <laughs> that will be <laughs> Your questions in Ask the Five. Ask us anything. Send it through to gbviews at gbnews.com. First of all, though, it's your Saturday night news with a much more sensible Polly Middlehurst. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. I do hope so. The news from the GB Newsroom tonight is that nationalities of migrants who commit crimes could be published in a table, with ministers saying it would give governments more power to tighten immigration laws. A group of Tory MPs wants to see statistics on every offender convicted in England and Wales published every year. They say it would help with rules for the Home Office imposing stricter visa and deportation policies on individuals from certain countries. Meanwhile, almost 5,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel so far this year, with Border Force officials escorting around 300 people to Dover today after intercepting them. The Home Office says French police are facing growing dangers as they attempt to intervene, saying they're experiencing higher levels of violence and disruption on the northern shores of France. The interim DUP leader, Gavin Robinson, has told colleagues the party isn't about any one individual, saying instead it exists to build a better and stronger Northern Ireland. It follows the resignation of Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, who's been charged with historical sexual offences. The police service in Northern Ireland has since warned against any speculation on social media, saying anything that leads to the identification of victims is a crime and will be treated as such. It's understood Sir Geoffrey's told DUP officials he'll strenuously contest all the allegations against him. Counter-terrorism police are investigating the stabbing of an exiled Iranian journalist in south-west London. Paria Zarati, who was targeted outside his home, is said to be in a stable condition after suffering a leg injury. The London-based television channel Iran International says the attack follows Tehran's plot to kill two of its presenters in 2022. It's calling for stronger action against the regime. Police say they're keeping an open mind regarding any motive. The Cambridge rowing team has claimed a double victory today with the men and women winning the historic boat race on the River Thames. The rowers were warned not to jump into the water, though, after winning their events, as is tradition, because of the high levels of E. coli detected in the water. They were also advised to cover up any cuts with waterproof plasters and try to avoid accidentally swallowing the river. The men claimed their fifth trophy in six years, while the women cruised to a seventh straight victory. Summer is one step closer. The clocks are going forward tonight. Bad news is you'll lose an hour of sleep with the time shifting forward at about one o'clock. The good news, though, it signals the beginning of BST, British summertime, which means longer evenings and brighter days ahead. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. It's Saturday night and you're back with the Saturday Five. I'm Darren Grimes and I can promise that you're in for another very lively hour. Let's crack on with tonight's first guest. We're going to start this hour by crossing the pond for some showbiz news. And we'll have to start with the singer Lizzo, who says she's quitting because she is constantly up against lies. I wonder what Benjamin Butterworth has said to her. That comes a day <laughs> after she was criticised for headlining a fundraiser for <clears throat> President Joe Biden. But she's quitting music or quitting mu social media. Which one is it? What's going on? And who better to ask than our favourite showbiz guru, the journalist and author Nelson Aspen. Good evening, Nelson. So tell us, what is, what is your take on Lizzo? Well, good to see you guys. I have my own personal history with Lizzo. We can oh. get to that later. But no sooner did she get off the stage at Radio City Music Hall performing for that multi-million dollar fundraiser for President Biden than she made this rather cryptic and lengthy Instagram post. And, you know, you, you just said, is she quitting music? Is she quitting social, music, uh, social media? But I think what's more concerning is the language when she said, it's starting to feel like the world doesn't want me in it. 
I oh, didn't wow. sign up for this expletive. I quit. So that caused her millions of, of social media followers to be concerned for yes. her mental state. You know, is she, is she going to do some sort of self-harm? Even uh, far-reaching as Paris Hilton tried to reassure her on Instagram. So there, there is some kind of concern. She was facing criticism because of performing for President Biden, that that would somehow make her pro-war because the, the fundraiser was say. interrupted by pro-Palestinian groups. But she does face a lot of bullying because of her weight, because of her race, and because of her outspokenness. She's also facing a lawsuit by some of her ex backup dancers alleging sexual harassment. So she's got a lot on her plate, and I think she needs to hire a social media manager so she doesn't get her hands dirty with the messiness of social media. So was that the other piece of drama at the uh, fundraiser then? The, the fact that well, the, well, the there, stage there was, was stormed? It was full of drama. Full, was the, it the really? Streets, everything was snarled here. Uh, the, you know, it, the elite Hollywood groups were fundraising for three presidents while former President Trump was attending the wake of a slain NYPD officer who was oh, tragically well, killed. Does that uh, tell you everything you need to know? I'll leave that to viewers' discretion. Very upsetting, and, and, a, and a, a strange dichotomy uh, between uh, one group and the other, as if we're not divided enough. Well, there we are. Right, and then there was the Michael Jackson biopic, which is, is coming out, but it's apparently causing a fair bit uh, of controversy, is it not? Well, anything, anything surrounding the, the so-called king of pop, uh, controversy follows. I mean, uh, I, I was live on the air the day he passed away. I was reporting about Farrah Fawcett's death when I got the news in my ear that he had passed away, and I stayed on the air for seven hours, and then the next year of my life, I was running from Neverland Ranch to Forest Lawn Cemetery to the downtown L.A. courthouse to his Bel Air mansion. I mean, where Michael Jackson went, controversy always followed. And that's the case with the film. However, I would say the most encouraging bit uh, about the film's production, and it is underway, is that it's from the producers of Bohemian Rhapsody. And we all celebrated seeing uh, the, the life of Freddie Mercury portrayed uh, as beautifully as it was told mm. in that film. So I do have uh, some high hopes for this film, uh, and we will, see, uh, we will see warts and all, we are told. In fact, in the press release, it says it's riveting and an honest portrayal, an epic cinematic film that will examine his triumphs and tragedies. So oh. hopefully we will get a fair uh, recounting of the story. His son, Prince Jackson, is involved on behalf of, of himself and the siblings uh, to make sure the story is told in the Jackson point of view. Right. Some people call Beyonce the 21st century Michael Jackson. Obviously, she just released her new album, Cowboy Carter. I think it's had the highest debut on Spotify so far this year with over 76 million streams. How has Nashville taken Beyonce releasing a country album? The statistics are staggering, and at the end of the day, it really is the bottom line that will prove uh, her staying power in the country music genre. And, you know, there was, as, as, as Beyonce herself expected, there was a racist pushback uh, when she broke into the country music world, and her new album, Country uh, Cowboy Carter, actually has 27 tracks and celebrates uh, a lot of the sort of uh, pioneering black female country artists that came before Beyonce. But She's so talented, and mo much of the music is so wonderful that I think she will um, e eclipse any of the critics. It also helps that she has the support of none other than Dolly Parton. I mean, Dolly Parton's seal of approval will generally uh, smooth over anything. I mean, the woman helped find a vaccine for COVID, for goodness sake. But Miley Cyrus, Willie Nelson, everybody is on board with this not surprisingly, including Vice President Kamala Harris, who says that Beyonce is helping country music reclaim its black roots. That said, I will say it's almost impossible to listen to Texas Hold'em and not, you know, dance a little bit. She's done some, she's done some covers of famous country songs like Jolene by Dolly Parton, also a Beatles song, uh, River Dance, I believe. What do you make of these covers? Has she put her own twist on them or are the originals still the best? 
Well, I mean, it's that's uh, he said, she said kind of thing. But I think there's room for interpretation. I mean, her version of, of the Beatles' Blackbird is completely different from the Beatles' version, obviously. But it's it's sort of bridging the generational gaps. And it ha it takes on a new meaning for Beyonce's audience, which uh, there may not be many crossovers from the Beatles' audience to Beyonce's audience. But that's uh, that's what spreads the word and makes it interesting. So I, I, I'm fully in support of Beyonce uh, doing country music. Look at what it did for uh, Taylor Swift. All right, Nelson Aspen, thank you very much as ever for your insight there. Now, I'm going to turn to the panel and I want to ask you that question then that Nelson posed there, which was on the image difference between President Trump being at this memorial for a fallen police, slain police officer and then the three former presidents of the Democratic Party at this elite multimillionaire pop show dig, uh, shindig rather do you think that there is a do you I mean, see optically it looks yeah. bad like you can't deny that that it looks bad but at the same time there may be another day where trump is there doing his old little ymca dance shooting his ak-47 and and biden is there like handing out weapons and food to the ukraine so you know. this must make even you see president trump in a different light a man <laughs> of the people He's not a man of the people at all. I mean, look, President Trump <laughs> is the guy that, when he was visiting France, refused to go and visit the graves of American soldiers that had died and that wouldn't go there because it was pouring with rain. I mean, this is not a man who has any serious sense of service or respect at all. I dare say the only reason that he might have done what he did uh, the other day is precisely for the optics. Manipulation, yes, that is a much more likely scenario because Trump only uses people. He uses whatever groups he wants to use to get ahead and then as soon as they sort of go wait a minute you're not the guy you said you were he turns on them and it's all their fault so yeah it makes more sense actually that his people found out that they were going to be at this concert and they quickly arranged something. Well, hang on hang on well I'll be I'll ask you this question mm. but how how can it be right right that the Democrats were supposed to be that they purport to be the party of the working class now a lot of people watching this you've we heard of Lizzo being there other characters blah 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 multi-million money swirling all about for Biden's presidential coffers. Do you actually think that there is an obvious disparity like there is in this country where some people argue Labour isn't for the working class anymore. The Democrats certainly aren't, are they? Well, I think when it comes to American politics, politics and money are very much linked together in a way which is not in the same in the United Kingdom. I don't think you can say that the Republican Party isn't swirling around with money either when you've literally got a billionaire who's probably going to be the next president of the United States of America. I think it's a problem with the American political system, not necessarily a problem unique to the Democrats. But I will say on this, this particular issue, can we just call a Trump win a win? I mean, I'm not a supporter mm. of Trump at all, yeah. but mm. in this instance, you know, he was at this, he, he was at an event for a, a fallen police officer, yeah. whilst the other former Democratic presidents were at a Hollywood knees up. I mean, mm. the optics, terrible. This is a Trump win. Let's just call it that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Albie's absolutely right. And you know, in the run up to an election year, when the polls are so tight, they might not be in this country at the minute, but you know, certainly in America, when anything can happen, you've got to be on your game. You've got to make sure that every vote counts. And having these kinds of, you know, shindigs, as you put it, versus, you know, an optics of President Trump actually paying tribute to someone, look, this matters to the voters. But do you think, it, every, it does, it this, does matter. Is this political naivety then on the Democrats' yeah. part? Do you yes. think it was organised by Benjamin Butterworth? Well, I, any, <laughs> any, anything Benjamin organises and invites me to, I tend to decline. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, look, I, the only reason that he will have done this is for the optics. But, of course, it's so easily done the other way around. You know, he has endless rallies. Uh, you know, few, few successful yeah. people really like Ordinary him. Ordinary people, not Lizzo. Oh, come, oh, come off it. That's just complete nonsense. Darren, he's a billionaire with his own members club. He's not a man of yes, the people. So he can't be bought... Biden is bought by vested interests. So, but you were like saying what? that Trump was a Big man of green. people. Do, 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 do most ordinary men have their own members clubs in, in Florida? Well, I have no idea. I've never been to Florida. <laughs> yes. I think the answer is no, Darren. That's what you're looking for. I'll now. take you. I'll is take you. Gary? I'll take you. <laughs> I like the governor. 
Yeah. Yeah. This, was, <laughs> this event with, with uh, the three presidents, with Lizzo, was a fundraiser, and that is an absolutely essential part of the US No, it system. was a sop to TikTok. Look at President Biden, isn't he hip, down with the kids, whilst he's walking around needing a bloody Zimmer frame? I well, do actually, I don't think you should hate on the elderly like that. Oh! <laughs> 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 How the tables have turned. Right, so we're going to have to leave that one there, but I'm sure the viewers have got plenty of opinions on that. Still to come tonight, is, is it all over for TV comedy? Mm. <laughs> but next, <laughs> should women be allowed to join the Garrett Club? Mm, again. Would they even want to if they could? Friendship is about to go out of the window of two old pals here, Benjamin and Alby, going head to head in our Saturday scrap. You're with the Saturday Five live on GB News. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 pm. Serving police officers showing that up to 20% of them are thinking about quitting the force and doing so within the next year or two. What on earth is going wrong? The problem, of course, is that those that go will be the experienced ones to be replaced by inexperienced ones. Kevin Hurley, former Detective Chief Superintendent at the Met Police, joins me from his home in Surrey. Kevin, this figure is shocking. The terms and conditions have really dropped off under Theresa May's, uh, what I would describe as an attack on the police service, where their pay has really dropped off, spending power down about 22% on what it once was. Worse still, the golden handcuffs, which were once the excellent police pension, have been taken away and the pension is now much reduced. The other mm. thing that's killing them is the constant media and activist battering for police officers. Off the back of that one psychopath and the uh, the other, if you like, Tinder rapist, everybody now thinks the police are kind of all like that. What that means for the individual patrol officers, they're being given stick everywhere. For example, you know, their bosses left, right and centre are rolling over. Oh, yes, we're institutionally racist. What that means for a 25-year-old constable working in Ballam High Street is everyone screaming at him, you're a racist pig. They get surrounded on the streets when they try and do a stop and search on arrest. Add to that the fact that the criminal justice system is collapsing. They're tipping out the prisons with early releases so because, of course, there's no prison space. Cases are taking years to get to court. They're getting derisory offences, sentences, because there's no room in the prisons. All of that's really demoralising for the police. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the Saturday Five. As ever, thank you so much for all of your emails about tonight's topics. And boy, have there been some. We delved into the calories in Easter eggs with Diane earlier, and Helen has said we would eat a chocolate egg a day. <gasps> I mean, that is such a treat. For a week as kids <laughs> at Easter, 50 years ago, guess what? None of us were overweight. The majority of people were not overweight because in between Easter and Christmas, we ate healthy food and we were always out playing. Exactly. It's, mm. it's a good point. And kids are too scared. Well, our parents are too scared to let their kids go out these days. Oh, apart from the Milton Keynes lot. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Rob says, hi, Gan. It's 858 calories in a double burger. Uh, uh, you need to check. You see, I got that directly off the... 
seller's website. It's a popular <laughs> fast food chain that's you available in the UK. <laughs> No, 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 <laughs> not that no, one? no, 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 the royal one. Oh, OK. Hey. What is yeah. the royal one? As in the king. Oh. Ah, oh, yeah. Wimpy, yes. Mr Wimpy. <laughs> <laughs> he said he was loving the show, though, so thank oh, you, Rob. Thank you. Now it's time for our next debate. <clears throat> it's time for the main event. The Garrick Club... Now, it's not one that we're all frequenting, but the Garrick Club has come under fire for only allowing men to be members and seven women have been nominated as possible candidates for membership if the rules are changed. So should us blokes have an exclusive club, or is it a total anachronism? It's time for Albie, the AA man, Armin Kona, and Benjamin, float like a Butterworth, sting like a bee, <laughs> to lock horns. <laughs> Seconds out, it's round one. Quite often on this channel, we talk about the importance of single-sex spaces. And single-sex spaces are important. They're spaces that people can be in with other people who are like them, with other people who share similar experiences to them, with other people who have similar interests to them. So I will ask Benjamin the simple question of why is it OK for women to have single-sex spaces, but not OK for men to have single-sex spaces? There is, in fact, a female-only members club, the University Women's Club, that was opened, I believe, in 1883. Benjamin, would you call for the University Women's Club to start admitting men, if you're calling for the Garrick to start admitting women? Well, the fact is that those two types of venues came about for very different reasons. One of the reasons, as you referenced on this channel, lots of people will argue for single-sex spaces, is because they're talking about the dangers and the oppression of men, and that's why they need a separate space. The reason that men's only clubs exist is for a very different one. It's to execute power and exclusivity only within men. What about men. gay clubs? Now, I I've not finished, actually. Uh, and the fact is that you look at the Garrett Club, places like this, places like the Melbourne Club in, in uh, the Australia, which has had a very similar debate recently, they exist so that men can exercise their power and to exclude others from them. It is all about the narrow corridors of power. And I think as a society, we are way past the days where women aren't allowed in the corridors of power. But how can you say that it's all about exercising power when quite often women go in as guests. I mean, a lot of people would argue. They say, well, what, what, why shouldn't we admit women into these clubs? Because there are so many women in these clubs that come in as guests. How could you possibly say this is some sexist space where people want to oppress women and execute power when actually women are taken in as guests all the time? And would you say the same, Benjamin Butterworth, about a gay club that didn't let women in? Well, first of all, no, I don't think a gay club shouldn't let women in because they're gay women. Uh, I hate to break it to you, Albie. Uh, but look, you know, I don't think that uh, women should just be some handbag that is there as the bloke's accessory. You know, you make the point for me, I would suggest, about why women should be allowed to be a member of the Garrick or similar clubs. Because the fact is, many people make the argument, look, blokes are allowed their own space, their own association, just like the women are. But if you have these clubs where the women can come in freely to most of the rooms in the Garrick as a guest of the man that is the member, then actually what you're saying is that you want separate but equal, that you think that the women should be able to go in, so it's not even a bloke space, but they shouldn't have the same rights and protections. I think that is ludicrous. But they do have the same rights and protections because there are lots of women-only clubs. I just referenced one that opened 150 years ago. The point is, these private businesses are allowed to decide who they want to admit in as members. That's the whole point of a members club, exclusivity. And if you're exclusive, you're going to discriminate. So where does this end? Do we just ban all members clubs because they discriminate against people they don't want to be able to join? No, and I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a member of a members club that was founded by women in opposition to the these kind of things. So I'm proud to be a part of that. You know, having lots of Are you of different... proud to exclude people from that members club that you're a member of? Well, this is the thing. So you have these clubs that exist because they're about people often with a certain profession, a certain career interest. I think that's entirely legitimate and reasonable. What's not is to say that because of the bits between your legs, you can come in or go out of a, one of these places. Now, look, the Garrett Club has about 1,400 members. It's got a seven-year waiting list for people that even get accepted. This is about people right. taking 
putting power away. And I think a lot of people don't like having these small private rooms that control the rest of the country. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> That's over. <laughs> <laughs> what was We've that meant to be? <laughs> the end of the... <laughs> We've got quite the having on this show. <laughs> yes. quite the bell. Know, Benjamin, what I, I'm going to come in first there. And what I would say is that you said, oh, well, I don't think we should be segregating based on what bits people have. I mean, you were all for men being able to access Diane's single-sex spaces. That's I mean, not true. Because it is. Yes, it is. It's not, because that's the difference between gender and sex, which doesn't, in my view, align with what bits you have. But actually, there is a question. You know, would in this day and age, where the Garrett Club is exempt from the normal rules that apply to most businesses, in that it can have only male members, you know, how would a trans man be allowed into that club? Where would they draw the line then? But I think what's interesting is actually some of these men's only members clubs actually have trans women members of these members clubs. I think that's quite interesting because obviously they're seeing things as sex is binary, which in your eyes would be totally wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's all solved by just not having these places that exclude women. I mean, look, Diane, you are our token woman. Thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a glorious handbag. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're our guest in this Men Only Club. <laughs> uh, what do you make of it? I understand that the Garrick is a place where people do business. And that is the thing that mildly alarms me because it, although you say, yeah, they can go in as a guest, no. I, I wrote a play for Nancy DeLolio once. And uh, if you remember that. her, she was Sven Goran Eriksson's mm -hmm. handbag. Mm -hmm. And um, she was a member of many of the private clubs around London. And there is a definite difference when you are a member and when you are a guest. So that's the first thing I will say. They, they are not on equal parlance. But secondly, like when it comes to a single sex space, uh, if it's like a changing room, then yes, please, I would like that a single sex space because uh, I, I don't want just a man wandering in. Like, that's just well, this, the way that I feel. <laughs> I just don't want a, a dude wandering in just because I'm like, who are you? Why are you here? Why do I now have to be on alert? Mm. Like, even if you mean nothing, I'm still like, eh! Like, but when it's the halls of power and decisions being made, then... It kind of... I think it's right that people have resigned from the club because they've said, I don't oh, agree oh, with no, them. Oh, no, we've had that mm, to show mm, us yeah. on that side of the Garrett Club, but, uh, saying, let me in, let me in. No, I'll no, tell no, you what, no, if the Garrett Club lets in Dr Shola, it'll go down a hell of a lot quicker than it will <laughs> if they don't let women in, mm. full stop. I mean, I'm just saying that, like, do you... If there's important decisions being made that affect the country, I do weirdly agree with Benjamin. Uh, but at the same time, if it is a private members club and you don't agree with their ethos and they want to exclude people, just don't be a member of well, that club. The only thing I would come in on this is just that I don't think it's a binary choice whether you have men-only clubs or women-only clubs or not. You can have everything. You can well, have, we have everything. You, you can have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can have men-only yeah. clubs. I've got nothing against it. You can have women-only spaces. You can have uh, clubs where there is you know, a mix of people. But I, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think Albie was onto something because, you know, uh, if you talked about you know, gay clubs earlier on, I want to see, you know, gay pubs for just gay men because it's a space for gay men to go to if they want to well, just as you can have you just you can have just, you can, just as you can have uh, I, well I don't want to see hen parties of women coming in you know uh, every yeah, other week I don't want to see you know, yeah. you, would be fine but, but you can also have bars where there are mixed of people if that's what the bar wants to do but you can it's up yeah. to the discretion of the bar but you can have the best would of you both. ban women in that scenario hen no. parties at gay clubs hen would you parties. ban that <laughs> yes well that's that's quite a different question really it's the same question it's not because I also wouldn't want a stag doing Right, and actually, lots, oh, I would. Lots, <laughs> <laughs> can I just say, lots, lots of people that lots of people that run pubs around this country, they have a right to, you know, it says it on the door when you go in. They have a right to ask anyone to leave that they don't want. I just don't think that should be based on whether you're a man or a woman or something. Else. Okie doke. Right, you let us know who you thought won that one. Coming up soon, you still get have time rather to ask your questions in Ask the Five. The email you need is gbnews at gbviews.com and. Next Next, we'll be joined by the comedian Bruce Devlin and we'll ask him if TV comedy is in danger of dying out. You're with the Saturday Five live on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Office. We're looking ahead for the rest of Easter. I think the best of the sunshine really is going to be reserved for more northern parts of the country. 
for the south, especially as we come into Easter Monday, it's looking very wet. So out there at the moment, we've still got low pressure in charge, and that's bringing in another band of heavy showers across more southwestern parts of the country. That will spread its way towards Northern Ireland as we end the night. Elsewhere, plenty of clear skies, so that's a perfect recipe for a fairly chilly night, a touch of frost across Scotland, with some misty low cloud just beginning to move in across parts of the east. So we do start Easter Day off on a fairly sunny note across many central parts of the country. The cloud across the east will gradually just spread its way a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather grey afternoon to come with some spots of rain. Brighter further west and especially so for Scotland and Northern Ireland here, a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures in the sunshine reaching 14 or 15 degrees. Into Easter Monday, a pretty wet picture for a lot of England and Wales. Some of the rain will be quite heavy. Could turn brighter later on down towards the southwest, but the, again, the best of the brightness will be for Scotland and Northern Ireland with a mixture of sunny spells and showers. And unfortunately, the changeable theme does look like it will continue as we head into Tuesday and also Wednesday. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to the Saturday Five. Your emails are flooding in. And listen, we will welcome the views of men and women. <laughs> Joe says, men's clubs are boring. Joe, why have you been to men's clubs? <laughs> <laughs> Just like men would find women's clubs boring. We also discussed the presidential elections earlier, and Bridget says neither Trump or Biden should stand. It should be younger candidates. You would think in a country of 300-odd million people that maybe, just maybe, they could find one. Sean says one thing about Trump. As the last president, no wars happened. Very true. Very, very true. Moving on now to our next topic, and it seems that despite the best efforts of Benjamin Butterworth on this show, <laughs> TV comedy may be dying out. A new report by Ampere Analysis shows there was a 41% drop in the number of new comedy shows ordered last year, and even established shows are being axed. The BBC's popular sitcom Motherland is on the way out. I love that, actually. D uh, despite winning a BAFTA in 2020. Who better to ask than a man who regularly has us laughing on headliners and free speech nation, Bruce Devlin. Bruce, good evening. Hello, Bruce. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. So come on, tell us good. why. Do you think comedy is dying on telly? The stats would can suggest so, wouldn't I'll they? Say hello to Diane. Yes. I'm an agent. I think with the main channels, they seem to be pulling back on what they're commissioning and stuff. But you have to remember as well, so much more comedy is on other streaming platforms such as Netflix, Disney+. Plus. You have to remember a lot of up-and-coming comedians, they, all their content seems to be on TikTok and Instagram. So kind of traditional sitcom or comedy shows. I mean, I don't think we'll ever lose things like Live at the Apollo. Um, but, yeah, I do... I am aware of the fact that they are pulling back and they, they say it's to do with money. But I don't think it will die out altogether. 
But do you think Live at the Apollo, for it to take that as an example, the mm -hmm. kinds of comedy that you could tell at Live at the Apollo has narrowed? Would you accept that? Um, I think I think what you have to remember is that we live in a time now where people are more mindful of what they say. And it is expected that you wouldn't go on and be racist or homophobic or misogynistic or anything like that. I think you still can pretty much say what you like as long as the joke is funny, but you would have to then, if you were doing anything, and I'm loath to use the word edgy, if you were to be doing something edgy for whatever reason, then you have to accept the consequences of that. Not everyone's going to like that. But I don't think we're in a state where people are being told what to say in comedy clubs as yet. All right. Do you think that's coming, Diane? Um, I mean, there are comedy clubs which obviously sort of clamp down on what you're saying before you've even got on stage, but they're very few and far between, and you just have promoters who are just silly. Um, you made the excellent point, Bruce, that um, a lot of the comedy is on the streaming platforms, and yeah. I suppose this cut, this 41%, is happening to the terrestrial channels, but um, is that because, do you think that when you get something onto a streaming platform you can binge it all at once you can just consume it all at once is it that the tr is it because comedy is falling the same way as like any other drama or soap opera people just don't want to wait well i i think what the thing is i think you're right about that and no one watches but like, obviously the majority of the people on the panel tonight are very you know much younger than me and are you know down with the streaming and all that kind of stuff in my day you watch things more traditionally you walked it week week by week if you see what i mean so i genuinely do think it is the case that people do want to binge whatever it is and if they find something they like then they will just do that so it's not that quality isn't you know being made I, I agree with you diane it seems to be the terrestrial channels that are pulling back for whatever reason <laughs> Bruce, can I ask you a question? Do yes. you think that because the way that people consume their media, as we've mentioned, is changing so much, so what a 20-year-old is seeing and the attitudes they see could be totally different world to a 70-year-old, which has not been possible mm -hmm. until very recently. Do you think it's a mm -hmm. lot harder to make comedy that actually the whole family laughs at and that's why the viewing ratings are going down, why they're not putting the money in? Um, I, I don't know if it's to do with people not viewing. Um, I got the impression it was all to do with kind of production costs and things like that. I think it is probably more of a challenge now to do an all-inclusive, um, you know, show that would take from the grandkids to the grandparents, if you see what I mean. Because obviously you have to work out what's age appropriate and appropriate for who the, the, the audience. Um, so I think things are probably nowadays a little more niche because people know where to go and get them, and that's normally a streaming platform. But Bruce, one of those shows which I thought was something that people laughed at, from children to parents to grandparents, was the BBC's mm. Motherland. But the BBC mm. have allegedly announced that that's going to be cancelled. So it even seems that the popular shows are getting cancelled. What's going on at the BBC and their content procurement? Well, I don't know. The big problem is that they haven't given me any opportunity, and I think that's maybe why the figures are in the toilet. I'm joking. <laughs> um, I, 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 honestly, <laughs> um, I think with things like Motherland, because I read what Diane Morgan had said, that she had so many women coming up to her in the street and saying, you know, we absolutely love this. We, you know, we can't believe that it's going. So I'm unable to give you an editorial decision on behalf of the BBC. I don't know. It is bewildering, though, when something is that successful that they want to get rid of it. Um, as a, because you are an absolutely brilliant club comic and I've worked with you a lot, but have you noticed that we now as club comics have to have an online presence? Yeah, I, I think you're holding yourself back if you don't, because it's all about... People say this constantly with things being commissioned by the big chat. They're not necessarily looking at the talent, they're looking at the talent's followers. So they want to see how many followers someone has. And I've been hearing that for the past two years now. It's nothing to do... In the way, and don't get me wrong, there are people with loads of followers that are fantastic. I'm, I, I'm not poo-pooing them. But there is a lot of drive now to marry the kind of more traditional viewing things with social media and, again, other platforms. All right, Bruce Devlin there, thank you very much. We'll see you on Headliners, of course, in Free Speech Nation. Now, Charlie, Tomorrow. you didn't get... You won't. What? I won't. <laughs> or I will. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> right. Right, OK, Charlie Rowley, you didn't get a bite of the cherry there. I want to ask you, you're a funny man. 
You were in your last... One way of putting it. Much <laughs> more directly that's, in front. That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> your, your last performance on stage was as the Cowardly Lion. <laughs> <laughs> a production of Wizard the Oz. It wasn't quite the West End. But yes. you'll get it, was, it was an off West End production. Off -West it was in Plymouth. It's quite true. Plymouth. Yes, yeah, so very, very off West End. Um, yeah. there, it was Potter's Bar, as it happened. So the good people of Potter's Bar, they might recognise me from that uh, from, from that performance. Do you yeah. do you think jokes that you could have told even when you were at school, perhaps? you couldn't tell them these days. And do you think that, that that is? I do disagree with Bruce. I do think that actually there is a climate in which people are terrified to say things. So I, I do worry about this because I think comedy is so essential just to life. You know, we all need to have a good laugh. Uh, otherwise, you Could know, things... Could Clary make the Norman Lamont joke now? So I think he probably could actually now because it's been sort of well established and that's his sort of genre. But you know, a bit like what Albie was saying earlier on, you know, the family sort of shows. I mean, Benidorm springs to mind. I think that was something for kids, for uh, parents, and for grandparents. That was sort of cross generational. But I do think there is a worry, and Bruce kind of touched on it earlier on, where I think where writers start to hold back because of fear of being cancelled, because of the fear that it's not going to be uh, 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 taken up by the BBC because of yeah. all this tick boxing exercise, and you've got to, yeah. you know, you've got to be, you know, polite rather than just but saying. Right. Some comedians who were pushing back, people mm. like Ricky Gervais, yes. people like yeah. David Le Chappelle, Quite who were right doing too. really well, mm. actually pushing back on all yeah, this but what, nonsense. What I find really strange is that it always comes to this argument of, oh, we can't make these jokes anymore. I don't think it's that's it. I think there's something else. I mean, if you make a, a, like they're cutting the comedy by 41%, but they're giving like the drama 16%, they're giving the crime 9%. So they clearly are just choosing to funnel their money into other places. And although comedy is important, I think that maybe comedy is just not happening on the terrestrial channels. Mm. I think that Bruce was right. Oh, it's wow. actually migrated to streaming. And can I just say, Julian Clary couldn't make the Norman Lamont joke back then because his career was destroyed by it for oh, about yes. 10 years. Well, I don't even know what the joke is. I've got to be. Oh. <laughs> well, ironically, I won't repeat <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> We've all got our own question. Norman Lamont's beautiful red box. Yes. Still ahead, are age gap relationships the road forward or a dead end? Relationship expert Kezia Noble will be here to answer that one. But next, you wonderful viewers take back control. It's almost time for Ask the Five. You're with the Saturday Five live on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. So many of you have been getting in touch over the WASPy issue. And actually, I just want to bring forward a view from Tony, uh, who has written in to say uh, something that we haven't included in this conversation well, so then. far. Tony says, it was well publicised, stop all the crying. His words. He says the Pensions <laughs> Act 1995 provided for this change. It was marginally sped up in 2010, but the fundamental issue, the WASPy issue didn't come about in 2010 or 2011. It came about in 1995. Yeah, people, people know that the, the legislation was earlier, but the problem was is a lot of women weren't told. Beverly, who's a WASPy woman, has written in saying, were the WASPy women living under a stone? I am one of the women who was affected by this change. My peers and I were fully aware of the changes. It was widely discussed on TV, radio and in newspapers as soon as the decision was made. We weren't happy at the time, but we recognised that it was fair. So it's wrong to spend billions in this way. I'd rather the post office people who suffered so much were reimbursed. Well, I think for the social contract to work mm. and for our society to be cohesive and harmonious, if that's possible, you can't just have <laughs> people who, 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 who don't work or don't, or don't have much have all the, receive all the, all the benefit. Well, now you're arguing against people. You're saying that people should have, in, to some extent, have looked in 1995 when the change happened. But, but fundamentally, it's not just it's not just WASPy women who've been screwed over since the financial crisis. We have a 70-year high tax burden. Someone earning uh, 60,000 pounds this year will pay more tax than someone earning 60,000 pounds has ever spent uh, has ever had to pay before. Yeah, Tom, Tom, you These do realise this isn't the first time that we've well. had hugely high uh, tax rates on income.
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. <laughs> Welcome back to the Saturday Five. It's time for the part of the show where we answer your questions. No topics are off limits. And you've been filling up our mailbox at gbviews at gbnews.com. First question has come in from Cathy. Good evening, Cathy. She has a question specifically for Charlie the Cowardly Lion. <laughs> <laughs> and she is not beating around the bush. She says, Hi, Charlie. How long do you think the Tories will spend in the political wilderness after they get wiped out in the general election? Well... Well, um, that's, oh, here we go. that's if you assume that they're going to get wiped out in the oh, next uh, general election, and I don't, I don't take, I don't take that same view, I'm afraid, um, because I think it's all to play for. I think the public, I mean, when the Kathy doesn't have to be a clairvoyant, to <laughs> <do that one. laughs> but it's true, it's absolutely true. When the election comes, because there isn't an election calls, we don't know when it's going to be. There's lots it's of speculation. There's going to, well, there's lots of speculation, but the reality is, there's only going to be uh, one person that becomes prime minister. It's either going to be Sir Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak, and I think when the polls. Uh, uh, when the election gets called, the polls will tighten and there will be a real choice for people to make when the policies come forward, because Labour haven't got any policies at the minute. Okay. And any other vote for any other party, whether you're thinking about voting reform, Cathy, I don't suggest that you might be, but you might be. Um, but if you do that, that is a vote for Labour and that will take uh, the whole country back to square one. OK, so can I just give you a reality check here? I was listening to <laughs> Professor Sir John Curtis. From you! Uh, <laughs> quite, here we go. I was listening to Professor Sir John Curtis. He's here now. Who is... <laughs> Who is, you know, this country's most popular pollster mm. who gets it right really quite consistently. And he says that there is a 99% probability, uh, and he's saying that in literal terms, not hyperbolic terms, that Keir Starmer will be the Prime Minister. And so if you take uh, the biggest change during the election campaign since World War II, the biggest squeeze, which was the lead the Tories had over Labour in 2010, which fell by six points during the campaign, and if you take the most mistaken election, which was 92, from what the polls said compared to what happened on polling day. If you had both of those happen in the same election, you'd still have a Labour government. Ooh, ooh. That's how big the lead is. Ooh. So there is no chance in hell of that happening, well, short of Sir Keir Starmer, you know, murdering well, someone all, in the all, all I would say to Cathy and to you and anyone that's interested in the polls, look, in 2010, uh, it should have been a Conservative majority kicking out Gordon Brown. It didn't happen. In 2015, it should have been Ed Miliband as Prime Minister. <laughs> The, the Tories got a majority. In 2016, we should have remained in the EU if you were going to listen right, to the polls. Okay. In 2017, Theresa May was going to win a thumping majority. Never happened. In 2019, okay. you could have had the prospect right. of, of Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister. Didn't happen. Well, so I, the polls are the polls, but the only poll that matters is the, the one on polling election. day. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the general election. Well, yeah, All thankfully, right. that's the one where Keir okay. will bring. OK, OK, OK. <laughs> Next up, it's Harriet, and Harriet has a question for Diane. Good evening, Harriet. She says, hi, Diane. Very nice to see you back on the show. What great comedians and shows inspired you to get into comedy? I need something funny to watch. Oh, my gosh! <laughs> what? Is, is, is that a cut on us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I must admit, Harriet, I absolutely love... Um, I'm a, I love absurd comedy. I love edgy comedy. Um, I quite like what the Americans do. Um, one of my favourites is Maria Bamford. I went and watched her live at Leicester Square Theatre. She's very offbeat. She's kind of very quirky. She does voices, really exciting. Uh, somebody else who I really enjoy, I do enjoy Frankie Boyle because he doesn't hold back. Oh, he just yeah. goes for it. And he See, look, oh. Darren's already very angry about that suggestion. Um, I like a comic very called... Very angry Dunks. ginger man. 
<laughs> I can't think what's in Do you like him because he's ginger? <laughs> yeah, that's how it works, yeah. Albie. <laughs> yeah. What? They all know each other. Uh, <laughs> I particularly love... Um, uh, I particularly love clever and funny writing, so uh, I really enjoy watching sitcoms, which is quite interesting because it plays back to what we said about 41% of the comedy programmes being cut. Like, I love the writing, like, the audio books of... Um, Doug, Dirk Gently, the the holistic detective. So I, I find that. Um, do watch it. What do you make of, of when people do uh, sort of spoofs of people? Because there was that there was that controversy the other week where there was a comedian called Jan Ravens who did a brilliant Diane Abbott impression. This is back in 2017. Also did a Theresa May impression. Right. And people were saying that it was racist because she'd done this impression of Diane Abbott. Yeah, there's a whole... like Well, obviously, and you've got the Little Britain guys who uh, regularly did blackface and they dressed up and they dressed up as women, uh, women as well. Um, I think that if the spoof is cleverly done and they have accurately made a, a, a funny... Like, it, it's not being detrimental, it's really bringing the character to life. I think you can do a clever spoof. Um, I haven't seen the spoof in particular that you're talking about, and the weird thing about comedy is that it's so personal, isn't it? So mm. I, I think more of it needs to be out there than we want it to be so that everybody has a choice. But what I would say, though, using Frankie Boyle as a reference, I think yeah. is really quite useful, because Frankie Boyle used to say things that were totally outrageous. He took mm. Mickey out of Katie Price's disabled child. Oh, no, I didn't like that. But... But now nah, he would never dream of saying that. He's walker than Benjamin Butterworth now. Oh, yeah, he's completely flipped, hey? But you said comedy... You don't think comedy has become more censorious. I would argue Frankie Boyle is the perfect example. I would argue that ha Frankie Boyle has censored himself. Yeah, and... because he's so scared of the environment and being cancelled. Yeah, well, that's his issue, yeah. and that is up to him to make a choice to make as an artist, because, you know, he doesn't want to sort of... I, I guess he saw the tide changing and went, I'm going to get on this bus. Well, can I All just right. say, I loathe Frankie Boyle. He's not funny. He's just an angry man. My favourite comic is Joan Rivers. Yes! I, brilliant! I, and I was lucky enough to interview her right before she died. All right. I didn't kill her, but would she <laughs> would she survive today? I'm not sure. No, I don't think she would. But next up, it's Andrew. Andrew has a question for Benjamin and uh, says, Benjamin, is it not because of woke snowflakes like you that we are not making comedies? You all get easily offended. Uh, well, clearly, I don't think that. Uh, you know, I think I have a great sense of humour, and, and so I re it really frustrates me that people think that young people, that so-called woke people like me, can't have a great sense of humour. But I think we... You know, the truth is, with this question about offensive jokes in inverted commas, is that is sometimes saying it's a joke, an excuse for something that is essentially just offensive. Yes, and th the weird thing is, is that uh, you can make a joke and you can look at it in two ways. You can look at the emotional response that you get and you can look at the technical competence and how you created it. You can also actually include in the attention of that. And it's really interesting, because he's just said, oh, you're woke and you've destroyed comedy, but literally right before that, you said, I interviewed Joan Rivers. Yeah. I love Joan Rivers. Nobody was kind of more... I mean, she insulted everybody, which was fabulous. All right, we don't have very long, so I want to get to Georgia's question. Georgia says, what will the Saturday Five be doing this Easter Sunday? Well, Georgia, if you tune in to <laughs> GP News <laughs> at 1pm... Oh! Tomorrow, you will see me for two hours. And, and me, then... I'm on with you. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after that, I will have a drink in my hand. And if you tune in at 11am, <laughs> you'll see me with Michael Portillo talking about the week's politics. But after that, I yeah. will be going to see my, my grandfather, Aww. who is 92, 91 wow. or 92. Um, so... Hopefully, going to see him. Well, I'm going to see him free, so I'm really looking forward to it. I'm Matt, gonna... What are you up to? Oh, I'm making fudge. I'm making you more fudge. Making fudge. Oh yeah, but I've got a load of dried fruit, so I'm making lots of incredible fudges, like banana and cranberry and strawberry. It's, mm. it's wondrous. Charlie. Oh, I'll be uh, a legs over a skip somewhere. <laughs> 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 With any luck. <laughs> no, neither did I. <laughs> I'll, be having a, I'll be having a gay old time. <laughs> I'll, I'll be eating a whole Easter egg as well. That's yeah. what I'm yeah. sure. In one go. <laughs> in Dubai. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever think about it before you do it? As in, do you worry about... <laughs> about my the... fatty liver? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't. Um, 
but you know I eat too much sugar so I probably should but you know actually Easter to Sunday isn't the main thing Easter Monday when all the Easter eggs are yeah. discounted yeah. 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 so the real question is the answer to your question is Sunday I'll be here but Monday I'll be in the aisles of, of Tesco and Lidl and whatnot getting all the leftover you Easter don't eggs. go to Lidl Benjamin yeah, no, I, 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 I don't I'll stop trying to be related <laughs> yeah. uh, you stopped that long ago <laughs> <laughs> only eat, um, like, eat a quarter... Good rule of thumb, eat a quarter of the egg, make your Easter And then have longer. the other three quarters. Uh, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Abby, Abby, can you do that? Can, have you got the willpower to... Yes, the... I'm actually very good oh, when I'm it not. comes to controlling my eating. Oh, I right. can be very good. I wish this. I was like that. Coming up next, though, we've got the relationship guru, Kezia Noble, who will be in the studio <gasps> to give out some dating advice. There's plenty of us here <laughs> that would benefit from that. You're watching the Saturday Five live on GB News. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Office. We're looking ahead for the rest of Easter. I think the best of the sunshine really is going to be reserved for more northern parts of the country. For the south, especially as we come into Easter Monday, it's looking very wet. So out there at the moment, we've still got low pressure in charge, and that's bringing in another band of heavy showers across more southwestern parts of the country. That will spread its way towards Northern Ireland as we end the night. Elsewhere, plenty of clear skies, so that's a perfect recipe for a fairly chilly night. A touch of frost across Scotland with some misty low cloud just beginning to move in across parts of the east. So we do start Easter Day off on a fairly sunny note across many centres central parts of the country. The cloud across the east will gradually just spread its way a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather grey afternoon to come with some spots of rain. Brighter further west and especially so for Scotland and Northern Ireland here, a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures in the sunshine reaching 14 or 15 degrees. Into Easter Monday, a pretty wet picture for a lot of England and Wales. Well, some of the rain will be quite heavy. Could turn brighter later on down towards the southwest, but the, again, the best of the brightness will be for Scotland and Northern Ireland with a mixture of sunny spells and showers. And unfortunately, the changeable theme does look like it will continue as we head into Tuesday and also Wednesday. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. I'm Emily Carver. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Dubry, and this is GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's Saturday night, and this is round three of the Saturday Five. <laughs> I'm Darren Grimes, along with Albie Ammon Corner, Diane Spencer, Charlie Rowley, and Benjamin Butterworth. Plenty more delirious fun to come tonight, including Albie's visit to the boat race. And we'll hear from Andrew Doyle on the protest marches this afternoon. Uh, it's 8 p.m., and this is the Saturday Five. Still to come tonight, we'll be doing Benjamin Butterworth a nice deed and asking for relationship <laughs> advice by the expert, <laughs> Kezia Noble. And we're asking if age gap relationships can work. Uh, that could be beneficial. <laughs> and we will be tackling five quick hit topics in Bunch of Five. Jonathan Ross's filthy showering habits are going to come under the microscope, or lack thereof, actually. First of all, though, it's your Saturday Night News with Polly Middlehurst. Thanks very much indeed and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom tonight is that the nationalities of migrants who commit crimes in Britain could be published in table format, with ministers now saying it would give the government more power to tighten immigration laws. A group of Conservative MPs wants to see statistics on every offender convicted in England and Wales published every year. They say the rules will help the Home Office impose stricter visa and deportation policies for individuals from certain countries. Meanwhile, almost 5,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel so far this year, with Border Force officials escorting around 300 people to Dover today after intercepting them. The Home Office says their French counterparts are facing growing dangers as they attempt to intervene, with police there saying they're experiencing higher levels of violence and disruption on the northern shores of France. Welsh military camps will be used to house Afghans who risk their lives helping the UK. East Camp in the Vale of Glamorgan will house people who worked with the UK government in Afghanistan but fled after the Taliban seized power. The site can host a maximum of 180 people, with 50 people expected by the end of March and more arriving in April. Those arriving are eligible under the Afghan Relocations and Assistance Policy Programme. Now, the interim DUP leader, Gavin Robinson, has told colleagues the party is not about any one individual, saying instead it exists to build a better and stronger Northern Ireland. It follows the resignation of Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, who's been charged with historical sexual offences. The Police Service of Northern Ireland has since warned against any speculation on social media, saying anything that leads to the identification of victims is a crime and will be treated as such. It's understood Sir Jeffrey's told DUP officers he'll strenuously contest the allegations against him. Household budgets are to be hit by bigger bills. A range of services and products, including broadband, mobile phones and TV licences, as well as postage stamps, are going up from Monday. The average annual council tax bill is also rising by nearly £100 a year and water and sewerage costs are also going up in England and Wales. It's not all bad news, though. National insurance is coming down along with energy bills, which are falling to their lowest level in two years. And classic Magnum ice creams are being recalled over fears they contain metal. 
manufacturer Unilever says the precautionary measure follows internal safety checks. Products sold in packs of three are being recalled with the warning linked to five particular batches all with a best before date of the 25th of November. The company has apologised to customers and says no other Magnum products are affected. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on the screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thanks, Polly. It's Saturday night, folks, and you're with the Saturday Five. I'm Darren Grimes, and I can promise we're going to finish on a high. Let's crack on with tonight's next guest. Now, for all of you, and don't be filthy, Diane. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. For all of you unlucky in love uh. fellas out there, we've got a treat for you. Joining us now is Kezia Noble, who has been described as the world's leading female dating expert for men. She's also written a book. It's called The Noble Art of Seducing Women which may or may not be available from all good <laughs> retailers and may or may not be relevant to members of the Saturday Five. With Vanessa Feltz <laughs> spotted on a cosy date with Tinder's most eligible bachelor, wow, and who is 29 years her junior, no less, we'll be delving into age gap relationships. Good evening, Kezia. I mean, Kezia, do you think actually... Uh, Vanessa Feltz having a big fat pay packet might help <laughs> things along a little bit. It does help, but uh, gradually a lot of younger men are going for older women. I know that from experience. What do you mean well, by experience? <laughs> <laughs> I'm married. Oh, how yeah. long have you been married for? Oh, we've been... You kept that quiet. Did I? Yeah. Oh, he's gorgeous. He's very nice. Uh, we met in 2000... Th we were friends for three years. We've been married since 2016. Yeah, yeah. So then... I, I, well, well, ignore your... We don't need to give you any advice because you're very happily married. But, uh, I give advice for men more than women. More than yeah. women, yeah. Um, and then what... So what advice would you... If you were looking to get into a relationship with, I mean, you say an older woman, uh, they'd be very intimidated, truly young men, by older successful women. Yes, that's true, but a lot of younger guys are now finding it harder to talk to girls their own age. They're just sort of looking at their phones all the time. They've got... Everyone has very unrealistic expectations now because of social media and dating apps. So a lot of guys are starting to prefer to go out of older women because they're actually finding it easier to talk to mm. them. Um, and, yeah, there's obviously some other things going on there, probably Cause... mummy issues and things. Well, I was going to ask, you know, do you think that young women have unrealistic expectations or, you know, are, are being too brutal on young men? Is that why they're going for the older ones? Yes, that's the feedback I'm getting from younger men, especially my, my younger clients. Yeah. They're saying that it's just they, they can't afford... Mm. A lot of it's very materialistic now. They can't mm. afford, you know, even to own a property now. Yeah. They're struggling. They're living like, you know, it's like they're 25 years old and they're living with five other guys. So just bringing a woman back to the house mm. is difficult. You know, it's exactly. logistics. How reductive do you take it, though? Do you get a lot of old, young men coming to you saying, I just can't even bring myself to talk to a woman, like I don't know how to mm. do it? Because, of, as you rightly identify, the social media age has captured especially the younger generation, right? They've never known life without the internet. Do you think, actually, the internet has probably killed off relationships with real people? Yes, 100%. Mm. So they're very reliant, over-reliant on dating apps, so they're not approaching women anymore. And not just that, but when you go on a dating app, you become very replaceable. You're suddenly putting yourself in that position where you're just one swipe away from someone else. But mm. if you meet someone in real life... Someone has to invest time in you to talk to you and they get a clearer picture of who you are. So it's investment. It's like investment on both sides. Whereas a dating app's not so... Um, it's, it's more like just convenience. And... So then would your advice, Kezia, be to say to younger people, don't go on and on on social media apps back and forth for months on end. Actually try and meet the person as soon as you possibly can. Do you think yes. that's the best way, see if there's a connection in person, being much more important than seeing if there's a connection via a dating app? Absolutely, 100%. And people should take a sabbatical from their dating apps because when you don't have the dating apps, what happens is it's, you force, you're forced to go and approach women mm -hmm. or men. Mm -hmm. 
So, Kessie, yeah. I have a question. Yeah, of course. So, let's ignore the young people. They can sort themselves out. They're running around shopping malls in Milton Keynes. So, what I want to know is, let's imagine that um, we're talking about older men. So, let's say that they have uh, got a child, they've been in a relationship, and let's say that, for whatever reason, that relationship is broken down. See, I'm a comedian. I know a lot of men. A lot of them are my friends, and a lot of them are single. And they, they want to date, and they just don't know how to go about it. What kind of advice, what, what are, like, your top three tips would you give to to a man who's already been married, he's divorced, he's maybe got a child, how does he get back into dating? OK, so in those cases, I would still say, because we have a lot of clients who are older guys, is still go to bars, go to clubs, go to the, the traditional way of meeting women, but also have dating apps as an extra, you know. Oh, OK. So you, wanna, you don't want to be over-reliant on dating apps because at right. the end of the day, you are going to have to meet that woman and engage with her and talk to her and make her laugh. And if you've just been hiding behind an app for years, you're not going to have those skills, those people's skills are just not going to be sharp. So they've got to meet more people, they've got to get out there. And talk to women, like, anywhere. Like, if she's on her way to work. I ended up with, like, two boyfriends because they chatted me up in the park. I was minding my own, but park is a great place to yeah? meet women because no one's in a rush in a park. Anyone that's my walking... stories are very different. Cassia, <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> what about work? Because we have seen a recent case where I think it's a Leicester City women's team manager has been sacked because of a le an alleged workplace relationship. Are workplace relationships ever a good idea? Yes, they're a brilliant idea. But not in this case. <laughs> they are. You, they are a brilliant idea. OK, the consequences, unfortunately, this is a new thing, OK? I love an office romance. They're slow burners. Yeah. They're so mm. much more exciting than, you know, just meeting someone in a bar or a club. You, it's a slow burner. You, you think, oh, suddenly I'm having feelings for this person. Yeah. And if someone's coming along saying, uh-uh, no, 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 not on my watch, guess what? You're back to the dating apps. It's just mm. trying to stop... I honestly believe that they're trying to stop people meeting in the sort of old-fashioned way. But when it's a manager with a player, is there not a power dynamic? There is. Pro is that a problem? It can be, but there can be a problem at any, you know, in any kind of relationship. But, yeah, I, but I have dated guys who were, like, my superior at work when I used to have an office job. They have, it was fine. Mm. But, it, obviously, if they start giving you benefits and they start giving you promotions over other people, that's wrong. Yeah. Can I ask, and it, it's related to that, do you think it's acceptable or legitimate to be attracted to someone because they've got a lot of money? Because in, in reality, that is something we think about when you're looking at people. Do you think, you know, we? getting an older woman because they've got money? Do. So money... <laughs> OK, so that's like the byproduct of money. So most people who are wealthy, most people, it's because they've, you know, they are determined, uh, they have a lot of self-belief, a lot of confidence to make that money. OK, mm. so they're quite dynamic usually. So it's what's indicative of the money that's attracted to people, to But women. some people just marry rich families because of the name. That's not because they're dynamic, yeah. is it? That's because they're, they come from a wealthy background, well, they've inherited wealth. Yeah, and you've got also some guys who've just worked hard, but they don't have the charisma and they haven't, you know, got mm. that sort of dynamic I was talking about also. And guess what? A lot of those guys struggle. They can get the woman's interest to begin with because, like, oh, he's wealthy, and then she starts talking to him and she's like, oh, he's got no game, basically. Mm. He's got no chat. I'm struggling at the moment. Maybe you can give me some dating Are advice. you on dating apps? First question. I am, but I've actually oh, got... I've got hold on, hold on, hold on. I've <laughs> Everyone got a I know who's not on dating I've got apps a question, is doing well. I've got a question about speaking to someone who I see in the gym who I find attractive. Oh. Oh, I've got... How, got how do I go about doing that? OK. So, with the gym, OK, it has to be slowly, slowly. If you go up to a girl in a gym, just ask her out, you're going to get a reputation for being, you know, the gym sleaze bag. Okay. You're not a sleaze bag, that's the reputation. No, we have heard that, I'll be honest. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, what you want to do, first of all, is you just want to approach just, like, friendly and just go, hey, you know, what are you working on today? We did say hi for the first time the other day. Just ask... OK, so what you've got to do is every time you see her, you've just got to add on a little bit more. Just extend the conversation. But what you've got to do, which is really important, is make sure that she sees that you're talking to everybody else at the gym because you're that friendly guy, right? Oh. Got to be that friendly Kezia, guy. Kezia, what if the she is a he? <laughs> <laughs> same, same principle, absolutely same, yeah.
Right, OK. Well, How, I'm going gonna, gonna to use that advice. Yes. Definitely. Uh, but where does uh, a man's sense of self-worth come in? Because at the moment we've talked about... What I worry about is that a lot of my friends who are going through this new change of life, they value themselves less because they haven't got a partner. Mm. Mm. I mean, um, have you got any advice for how sort of men can bu build themselves up to get that kind of bravery to approach that woman or man? Yeah, so what they need to do is they need to start approaching and they need to feel rejection, believe it or not. They have to go through, you know, that, that pain threshold. So they have to take the rejection so to deal with it. So they get numb to it. You wow. have to get numb to rejection. If you're never approaching, you're, you're going to be so scared of the rejection mm. that it's just going to make you very... Um, uh, what's the word when you... I'm oh, vulnerable. Three, three vulnerable. Three syllables. <laughs> what is it? Sorry. <laughs> but, Procrastinate, that's the word. Uh, yes. In, does, so, in your book, The Noble Art of Seducing Women... I didn't do... choose that title, by the way. That was my publisher's <laughs> choice. <laughs> great, you've, got a great, you've got a great publisher. Yes. I've got a good surname that you can do a lot with. Yes. <laughs> so, do you actually... Do you go into talking about... Because the... the one thing that we hear a lot in the news at the minute is the fact that people just aren't having kids, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not in the same way they used to. Is that... A, is, do you put that down to the way in which people are simply not meeting, there aren't as many relationships as perhaps they want, so relationship breakdowns are a lot more likely? Is that a real problem? I haven't seen an increase in relationship breakdowns. In fa fact, I see people holding on to marriage for dear life. Really? Or, yeah, because they can't afford not to be together anymore. Mm. I think there was a point where you could, you know, I think divorce, you could divorce and you could think, well, I'll get my own flat. You had that flexibility. Mm. But now I've seen a lot of people stuck together, like, and in very unhappy marriages, more so because they're like, I can't afford to rent anywhere. Mm. Or I can't, you know, afford a mortgage on my own. That's one thing. But also people are terrified of being alone. Terrified. Yeah. Well, it's fine, to be honest. But... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Can I... Benefits. You, you talk... About, obviously, you focus on men. Obviously men, what they can watch online and what they grow up thinking is a normal romantic life is very different to reality. Do men have a problem with unrealistic or, or distorted expectations of their private romantic lives? Not as unrealistic as women, but, yeah, it's still unrealistic mm. because they're seeing all these beautiful women, you know, that they think they've got some sort of connection on because they've sort of, you know, DM'd some girl on Instagram and they've created... And then there's OnlyFans and all this... Yeah. Completely delusional. Yeah. Let's be honest, there's yeah. a lot of guys out there who are delusional because they, they're dying for that contact with, with somebody, man or woman. They're dying for that contact. And so they sort of created this, this narrative in their head that, you know, this is my online girlfriend or something. Yes. There's something right. between us. She understands me. It's like, no. So they, they, Yeah, they can't do it in real life. They can't make that connection in real yeah. life. No, they can't, because they're, if you're texting... Think about it, we're all texting, and we're all very funny in our texts, and we've got the right emoji, we can re-edit, go back to it. Real life, there's no re-edit button mm. when you're talking to someone. Absolutely. That's Kezia, it. if people want to find out more about your work, where can they go? You can go to my website, kezia-noble.com. Kezia Noble, thank you very much for your time. Now, still to come tonight, well-heeled Albie felt right at home today when he got to hang out with the rowing set down at the boat race. But what do they make of the fact that their beloved Thames has turned into a fetid swamp? <laughs> They're in safety. Um, keep them out of the water. It's uh, pretty bleak. I've been in there myself. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't pretty, so... You're with the Saturday Five, live on GB News. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Could we talk about um, uh, opening up the new uh, Bond role <gasps> to someone, Alex? And, oh, um, yes. This is an actor called Aaron Taylor Johnson. Right. Do you remember when the director of the Fifty Shades of Grey films had a young, young boyfriend? Really, really young, like half her age. It was in all the papers at the time. Well, it turns out that was him. He broke his career, I think, in a film called Kick-Ass, which was... I, I watched it. Really great film. It's... You can't compare... What's his name? Who's, who's the last Bond? Daniel, Daniel Craig. Craig. Daniel Craig. You can't to Roger. Compare, you but can't... you can't compare Roger Moore to Sean Connery, either. No. Who's your favourite Bond? Uh, my favourite Bond is Piers Brosnan. Probably. Same. Oh, really? Oh, come on, yes. Sean Connery. Maybe For Sean. the classics. Yeah. I'm quite keen on Roger Moore. So, but I, I quite like the kind 
of uh, the ironic raise but, of the eyebrow and all well, that. Well, interesting, this sort of puts to death all of those rumours that James Bond was going to be a woman, James Bond was going to be a black man. There was lots of different rumours going around of what they were going to do with Idris his role. Idris would be good. He hasn't signed yet. I mean, he feminist, I would say James Bond shouldn't be a woman. I totally agree. Because we need to have our own stories that we tell yeah. and our own we heroes. We don't need to, yes. to kind of go in on that. We just need to have a story that celebrates a woman, I think. I agree. Who is your favourite, Eamon? So I do think if you, if you look at them all, there's not a bad one amongst them. Mm. But um, personally, I got to know Roger Moore and um, an absolute gentleman oh. and a man who was a star in every sense of the word and an impossibly handsome looking mm. man. Mm. Pierce, I think Pierce is very, very good. And Pierce, again, is a very likeable oh, yeah. fellow. Very, very, very likeable. <laughs> yeah. It's um, funny you say that the appetite, I think, for James Bond kind of is still there, but they are reinventing it. And the fact that the fact that they change it and kind of go with the time. I thought Daniel Craig was very good, actually. Can't I just avoid struggled them. with Daniel Craig the most because I just couldn't cope with blonde Bond. So the idea of a female Bond or you know, <laughs> I, I anything couldn't else, cope yeah. with Daniel Craig. So. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Back to the Saturday Five. Sorry, I'm just stopping me. Hi. As always, thanks for all of your emails about tonight's topics. Ali's written in and Ali says, My husband was 23 years older than me and we were happily married for 38 years. My hubby wasn't a rich man, but we fell in love and after a year or so, married. Many people thought it wouldn't last, but we lasted more than many of our friends. We laughed with each other, spent time together, but had our own lives. I miss him every day, but age is purely a number and a society issue. Oh, mm. that's so romantic. I thought that was very beautiful, actually. Thank yeah. you very much for, for writing in with that, uh, Ali. Now, next up, our next email is from... I'm scrolling... <laughs> Ian. <laughs> Ian. And Ian says, oh, here we are, it's about Benjamin. Benjamin, who I used to disagree with quite a lot, is, in my opinion, the most improved participant on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Good God. Let's make him a certificate. I think that's the way. Or not. <laughs> I doubt that his theories have changed, which is good, but his practices have changed, which therefore thankfully disqualifies him from ever being an MP. <laughs> Well, thank you. I put the effort in, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, Red has a compliment for Benjamin as well. He says, can you ask Benjamin if he's attempting to reinvent the beatnik generation with his dress style? <laughs> I, I don't know what that is. It's like the author, uh, Alan... Was it Alan? Uh, I don't back know in the... It. It's like, was it the 50s or 60s? You should know that. You're a writer. I, I, I'm, I'm red. I don't read. But no, um, I have <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I must confess. I don't even say names, but all my jumpers come from M and S. It's a, it's a pretty simple style. Well, I remember that top when it was a deck chair. <laughs> <laughs> right now, it's time for our next topic. We're talking about the Dirty Thames. Albie has been out and about today, <clears throat> mixing with the Oxford vs uh, v Cambridge boat race spectators in Putney, and he said, "My people, my people." He constantly <laughs> reminds of his, of his rowing exploits, so I'm sure he took it, to, took to it like a duck to water. The only problem is you can't go in the water because it's so bloody filthy. One of the beaten Oxford rowers in today's race actually said afterwards that he thinks one of the reason they lost is that they fell ill beforehand due to E. coli in the water. I think that's a bit of a convenient excuse, to be honest. Mm. I'll be asked the spectators what they thought of water so filthy it can make you sick. Safety, um, keep them out of the water. It's, uh, it's pretty bleak. I've been in there myself, uh, and it wasn't it wasn't pretty. So, 
What was it like when you were in there yourself? Um, I was quite ill for a few days. My opinion is, is becoming so ridiculous, all rules and regulation and safety and health and safety. It's nonsense because this is such a tradition. We try to solve it, it creates another problem. What do you do? We have to try to enjoy the environment as much as possible, but then obviously looking after the earth. So I think maybe let the rowers roll and then try to deal with that, in, that issue in the future. Do you think that the river will be any cleaner under a Labour government? Ooh, interesting. Uh, well, the super sewer was started about 10 years ago, five years ago. The Labour government, hopefully, I hope it does get in, uh, <laughs> and then we'll have five years to do something. It's probably not enough time. I, I think that it's, it's a general problem. Too many people, one river, you know, it, it's, it's a big problem for any government to sort out. I think the important thing is whoever take, gets into power, they, you know, they, they do what they have to do, their job, which is their servants of the people, right? Well, good to get the <laughs> advice and words from Gandalf. Lovely. Yeah, we'd love to see Vanessa Feltz there. <laughs> She's looking oh, well. Benjamin, Charlie, Benjamin. you're often known as the super sewer. What do you make of all of this? <laughs> well, I think it's... Um, uh, no, I, I, it's, I think it's a disgrace, actually. It is an outrage. But your party to... have presided over it. Well, I think there's two things. I mean, there's the deregulation of the water companies to make sure that actually you're not passing uh, uh, huge costs on to the consumers. But they, for too long, far too long, the big bosses of these water companies have failed to get a grip. They are polluting the waters. It needs to stop. The infrastructure that we have in this country is so far uh, behind in terms of the modernisation that we need to have to make sure that we have a, this, this clean-up effort. But it is uh, something that the water bosses have failed to do. But there should absolutely be no way that any funding black hole that they have, that they pass that on to I think the taxpayer. What was yeah. quite interesting about speaking to people out in Putney at the boat race today is that almost everyone said that they thought that privatisation had failed and that water should be brought back into public ownership. So, Benjamin Butterworth, why isn't that going to be on the Labour manifesto? It's one of Keir Starmer's mm. many U-turns. I mean, the problem with once you've privatised an industry is that it becomes extremely, probably punitively expensive to take it back because, you know, it's not a communist country. You can't just demand it into state ownership. You have to pay for it. I think the reality is that these companies that are failing to deal with the water, the supply of water, the quality and the cleanliness of water, while paying big payouts to their shareholders, I think that's something a government could deal with, just say that actually unless the quality improves, there will be punitive fines or bans from shareholder payouts, because that will change the economics of it and fix the problem. But, Diane, I sometimes feel that maybe we're just more aware of the fact that there's sewage going into water, because, as you might all know, I did used to row when I was younger, and one of the things that I would notice when I rowed when oh. I was younger is that... <laughs> Sometimes the river would really smell like sewage. And our trainer... Are you sure say, that was the river? Yes, um. it was the river. <laughs> our trainer would say, oh, it's because there's been, it, there's been a, a big storm and there's been an overflow. So this is something which has always been happening. And perhaps at the moment we are just more aware of it than we were in the past. No, but the problem is, is that the water companies have not been following uh, that system of, oh, we should only dump sewage in an emergency. I think it's something like... Um, I, forgive me if... I, I believe the number is 3.6 million hours oh. they spent dumping sewage into our public waterways. I mean, the boat guy saying, oh, yeah, I think we lost because um, I got ill. Sweetheart, if the water's polluted and you're all in the water, then it's actually a level playing field. <laughs> yes. Like, everybody has the yeah, equal opportunity to be polluted. Eco life, so, yeah. yeah, you want to sit down there. And it's a shame that when they won, they couldn't see that they had because they all had conjunctivitis. <laughs> so they, they definitely need to fix this. This is, this is absolutely horrendous and when you read reports about who actually is a shareholder in Thames Water, like when you look at, the, I, I believe China is a shareholder in Thames Water? I believe I read that somewhere and I sort of had to read it a couple of times and I thought, so wait, they're getting a big dividend and my water bill's going to go up and if I dare set foot in the Thames, I mean, I wouldn't anyway. I sort of lob bread in there and all it does is ferment and then the swans get drunk. So it, it's, <laughs> I, I think they need to clean up their act. I don't know who's going to do it. I don't know if Sir Keir's going to do it, if he gets in power. I don't think Rishi's doing it right now. I mean, yeah, what's odd about it is that it's such an obvious 
problem that ought to be straightforward yeah. to be fixed. I, I think the problem is the power of these companies and the profit incentives, which have to be overcome for a period because it's not in the public interest. Um, but I would make one other point, is that as we enter, you know, it's what day... British summertime begins in a couple of hours, yeah. and we can prepare for the routine of host pipe bans yeah. and water shortages, which in an island is ridiculous. Mm. But we've not built a reservoir in something yeah. like 30 years. And so that is another big part of this problem. But hang on, are we, to, just to play devil's advocate a little bit here and to give uh, Thames Water a little shout-out, do you not think population growth and the growth, the, the, the rate at which it has grown... Talk has about meant immigration, the, No, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> well, I am. The waterways have simply been unable to keep up. Yeah, but they don't seem to have even attempted to keep up. That's the issue. They but don't... how were they going to know that Boris Johnson would let 700,000 people into the country? But they knew the state of the world is That's the same old. <laughs> coming in or not. Yes, he wants us to lock down and we're not allowed to use our taps. <laughs> yes. You, you should be allowed to use your tap. We should build a reservoir. I do agree with that. But mm. the people blocking the reservoirs, Darren, are the pensioners who you always defend their rights on absolutely everything. If it was up to them, we'd build nothing. And guess what? We have built nothing. Well, it, well, if it was up to them as well, we wouldn't have mass migration. So, you know, that, that would solve that issue, wouldn't it? But if we stopped migration tomorrow, we still would have all of this waterway problem. <gasps> Maybe we only let plumbers in. <laughs> that's an idea. Oh, that's an idea. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now she's talking my language. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. Well, I'm going to move on from that now. <laughs> Still ahead, we're going to hear from Andrew Doyle. He has a great show coming up at 9pm. But next, in the bunch of five, Pearl Davis makes an incredible claim. Jonathan Ross only showers once a week. And how far would you go to look at a Banksy? I wouldn't go very. You're with the Saturday <laughs> Five, live on GB News. <laughs> oh, yes. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Office. We're looking ahead for the rest of Easter. I think the best of the sunshine really is going to be reserved for more northern parts of the country. For the south, especially as we come into Easter Monday, it's looking very wet. So out there at the moment, we've still got low pressure in charge, and that's bringing in another band of heavy showers across more southwestern parts of the country. That will spread its way towards Northern Ireland as we end the night. Elsewhere, plenty of clear skies, so that's a perfect recipe for a fairly chilly night, a touch of frost across Scotland, with some misty low cloud just beginning to move in across parts of the east. So we do start Easter Day off on a fairly sunny note across many central parts of the country. The cloud across the east will gradually just spread its way a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather grey afternoon to come with some spots of rain. Brighter further west and especially so for Scotland and Northern Ireland here, a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures in the sunshine reaching 14 or 15 degrees. Into Easter Monday, a pretty wet picture for a lot of England and Wales. Some of the rain will be quite heavy. Could turn brighter later on down towards the southwest, but the, again, the best of the brightness will be for Scotland and Northern Ireland with a mixture of sunny spells and showers. And unfortunately, the changeable theme does look like it will continue as we head into Tuesday and also Wednesday. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. 
With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the Saturday Five. Your emails are flooding in. David has written in and David says, regarding the uh, decline of comedy, comedians would be much more palatable if they toned down their language. Yes, you swear like a trooper. <laughs> <laughs> Too much effing and blinding, that's you in a nutshell. Yeah. It turns more mature people off. Oh, Do you think that's right? He's fudging right. <laughs> <laughs> Fudge again. Marcus, in a similar vein, says, you had a, com a debate about comedy. Why are the new TV comedies not as funny as some of the old ones? Many of the TV comedies of yesteryear were far funnier. Do you not think? Well, I do. Wait. I, I agree, actually. I think I look back at the days of Little Britain and the Catherine Tate show and Spitting Image. I mean, did anyone see the new version of Spitting Image on mm. Britbox? It was rubbish. And the old you, ones are much better. You know, I often watch Dinner Ladies uh, from the late 90s. You with, can get arrested for with, that. With, with <laughs> <Dinner Ladies. laughs> you shouldn't be at those schools, Benjamin. You shouldn't be there. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Dinner Lady, the, the Victoria Wood sitcom, and it's just absolutely brilliant. It totally t stands the test yeah, of time. God rest her, She's, she was great. Now, but as usual, Benjamin's clothing is attracting <laughs> the most discussion. Freddie's written in, Fashion Freddie, and he says, <laughs> Benjamin has a nice jumper on tonight for the second uh... week in a row. Freddie, I think you need your eyes tested. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I want to say hello to Freddie and to his guide dog. He says, I'm, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to call the fashion police on him. You're all looking very smart tonight. Well, thank you, Freddie. But, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some more than others. Uh, it's time for the bunch of five. Who's going to lead us off? I'm going to be going first, Darren. So, earlier on this week, I believe it was, in fact, yesterday, on Friday, a social media influencer named Pearl Davis went on our very own Lee Anderson show. Let's have a listen to see what she had to say. So I just look at large and I, and I think to myself, why do we deserve to vote? Are we paying taxes? No. Are we paying the hard, are we doing the hard jobs? No. If you just limited it to people that pay taxes, are not in debt, are not taking child support, alimony or any of that stuff, it would be like two women that could vote left. I took massive issue with this because look, ultimately oh. my, my point oh, was, yeah. if this was a, a, a Muslim imam in Tower Hamlets that had said something like this, there is absolutely no way that Conservatives would be giving these sorts of opinions any time of day. But I think, because this is a white lady from America, Conservatives think, this is someone I can get on board with. Hang on, who are you talking about? What Conservative has said... She is a big social media influencer on Tradcon Twitter. That is what she calls people, herself, a traditional but conservative. But most people are watching it and because people they get don't on, agree. Pe people get on board with this stuff. And Who? she basically has... She's got almost 500,000 followers, yes, Darren. She's it an they all idiot. Agree with her. Followers do not, does not equal or equate to a, a following... So are, are you saying there sense? are not conservatives that agree with this woman? I don't because think... Actually, can you, you look, look at her single name in the British context that agrees with Pearl's position look, there? All can I'm you give me a single name? I am not claiming to know that there is anyone. Exactly. But my point is, Darren, this woman has almost 500,000 followers on Twitter. I do think a large proportion of them agree with her. Diane, what do you think as a woman? I think this woman is an idiot and I think she shouldn't be allowed to vote. I think of uh -huh. all the women who went through history to earn the right to vote. Just because she doesn't pay tax, I pay tax. She doesn't want to vote, fine. Don't vote, Pearl. Stay at home. I'll vote for you. Don't worry. Just go away. What a vile idiot. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I am rarely this vitriolic about people. But when she is literally damaging hundreds of women's lives with her idiotic, just such a moron, just her, her rhetoric is appalling and it's damaging. And do you know what, Pearl? I want you to take a long walk off a short pier. Oh. That's a lovely little <laughs> English phrase for there. Ben, I mean, you actually agree with Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't. Look, I think if there were an IQ test for, for voting, she wouldn't pass it, most likely. <laughs> 
um, you know, when the right to vote was introduced in this country, only 5% of women wanted it. You know, that was a time when they really didn't have the access to property rights, the ability to work, any sort of financial security remotely like what we know today. But the lesson of democracies is that when you give people rights, they also grow their responsibilities. So her argument makes no sense. Mm. I think there's more sense in Benjamin's fashion choices than there is coming from Pearl. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right, I think that's Diane, true. it's your turn. <laughs> oh, so I love people who go on quests. I love people who are super fans as well, who, who get something and it drives their passion. There is a woman, I saw this article, there is a woman, her name uh, is Lorraine Holmes, and she lives in Leeds, and she is Banksy's number one super fan. She runs a uh, Banksy uh, website, and she travelled, she travelled to Paris with a broken leg to see a Banksy. She travelled five hours from Leeds all the way down uh, to that brand new one that was sprayed on the side of the wall in... Oh, where was it? Was it Fulham? That's a bit over the top, isn't it? With a broken foot, did you say? The one that she went to Paris, she had a broken leg. She had pins oh, in her leg on. and she still went because would you it was do a that? fancy. Would you do that, Diane? Would, would I travel five hours to see an artist that I loved and admired and, I had a, and they had suddenly done this work? With a broken leg? Yeah. yeah, but I'm lazy. Like, I, I don't really like <laughs> travelling at the best would of time. Would anyone on this panel do what this Yeah, but this woman is... I mean, what do you think? I'll like... tell you what I would do is just to carry out a private prosecution against a man that commits criminal damage on an industrial scale. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. I mean, <laughs> don't want his filthy communist art on that. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Look at that there. There, this is some Banksy. Would you want that on your wall? <laughs> I hope you would go out with a brush and scrub it off. <laughs> but I want it on my wall because it would make yeah. my wall worth so much money. I could just yeah. sell my wall and then never work again. No, but think no, about the passion. Actually, I might put in a request that Banksy does it on your wall. In that <laughs> 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 well, isn't there anything that you would travel, like, like the second... Is there an artist or somebody, the second they brought out something new, you'd leap in the car and drive? I'd come down miles to just do the Saturday Five again. <laughs> oh. Is this on? <laughs> this... Not did you, much did time. you hear me at the back? Right. I'm going to talk now about Jonathan Ross being a filthy bugger because he admitted to infrequent showering. Now, sometimes less than once a week, even due to a lack of physical activity. Ross and his wife Jane both occasionally go days without showering. He admitted they said that they're like hamsters in their straw. Now, he hadn't showered on the day of an interview for the Parenting Hell podcast. I bet it was hell. <laughs> Smelly beast. With <laughs> Josh Widdicombe. And Ross mentioned that he last washed yesterday. I guess that's not as bad. But questions the need for daily showering without exercise. Does anyone agree with Jonathan Ross? I don't think being a lazy slob is a great excuse for being a smelly swine, he right? Said, <laughs> I feel like those are just two bad things. Has anyone been to Florida? Yeah. I yes. assume Florida gets Florida. quite hot. It is hot. Mm. He says he didn't shower for two weeks whilst in Florida. <gasps> mm. Ooh. Look, that is disgusting. That really is disgusting. And also, of course, you know, you can get infections and things if, if, you're, if you're dirty. Uh, I just also have to say that like, my t I like a bath, to be honest, more than a mm. shower. I, I really value I have a bath every day. Yeah. And, but for me, it's not just the cleanliness. It's that mental... Yeah. Period to to think about your day to get refreshed. That's really valuable, not just the fact that you no longer smell. I think this is absolutely disgusting. I mean, how could you go on holiday to Florida and not wash for two weeks? Mm. Florida is hot. Florida is humid. Florida is sticky. And I've got this awful image oh. of Jonathan Ross <laughs> unwashed <laughs> for two weeks after a holiday in Florida and having to sit next to him on a plane. Yeah, I can but see also... Charlie Rowley licking his lips. <laughs> 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 He's not doing the British any much of a reputation, oh. him, is he? He's sort of walking no, around. Charlie. It's Charlie. <laughs> Jonathan. Jonathan. Yes. 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 He's just walking around and he just smells bad and he... Oh, they just it, that's horrible it's... did you think he's trying to be like quirky and sort of countercultural but there is this thing right where people say they don't wash their legs because your legs just wash, wash themselves them. because 
the soap <laughs> drops off your body. I mean, what do you say about that? Taylor Swift, I believe, does that. What? Well, she said so. Yes, I think I, I think I read something about Taylor Swift doing I this. She doesn't, she doesn't wash her legs because she just... Oh, you smelly little Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> that, that explains we might the restraining order against you, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, Taylor yeah, they don't call us <laughs> we, might, we, might hear, <laughs> yes. we might hear about it in the next Charlie, song that she brings out for us. Well, there was a story uh, earlier on this week um, uh, about the warning to Brits that might be going it? to... Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been distracted by that jump. <laughs> uh, that Banksy that's all over your, your belly. <laughs> there was a story earlier on this week about the warning to Brits if they're going to the Euros in 2024, obviously this year, this uh, summer, and not to drink the beer. Now, I like a beer as much as the next bloke, um, but I won't swallow anything. Just beer is fine for me on a night out during the Euros, but it, we're told not to drink it because the percentage of a, uh, of a German beer is far higher Just than the... Just 1%, actually, well, Charlie. Well, uh, higher. Is that all? 1% higher. I was talking about this on, a, on another station earlier on this week. The German beer is just 1% higher, and yet there's some, I think it's some official advice saying to England fans... Oh, be careful because the beer in Germany oh, is just one but percent. You but wait, I think wait, the... but it, does it add up? Because if you're not going to have just one pint. Mm. You're going to you're going to start your day maybe sort of twelve o'clock, and you're going to slowly drink and drink and drink, and those one percent will that's all what, add up. Yeah, that's what I did today, to be honest. So uh... <laughs> no, you've been doing that for <laughs> years all evening. Yeah, I'm not drunk, mm. to be clear. Um, I remember going to Germany and the beer was cheaper than the water there. So when you've got that scenario where it's cheaper and more alcoholic, mm. you know... But the thing is, do you really need people to give you this advice, right? Do you really want officials to be telling you how much Hang you can drink? Hang on, no. on today you were saying that you needed the advice <laughs> because, because you shouldn't eat a... Eat a, eat a Easter egg and all in one go. So There's a difference between mind up. needing the advice and taking the advice, Alex. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I think Brits are uh, well enough trained to know how to drink beer <laughs> in any country. <laughs> and I think, sure they, I think they will go over to Germany and drink uh, perfectly well. And... Well, I'm afraid I've got bad news that will make you want a beer because, and this is some breaking news, the Sunday Times have done a massive poll of 15,000 people. Right. It's one of these polls that's called an MRP, so that it's really accurate to what people are actually going to vote in particular constituencies. Now, the Tories aren't doing very well. They're set to have just 98 MPs, the worst result ever for the Conservatives. You're talking hundreds of years for that party. And Labour will have 468. And I'd also note, uh, Reform still will have zero MPs. I don't think we can just use the polls based on the information that we have at the moment because we don't have the manifestos out yet. And I do think that once the manifestos are out, once people realise that Labour doesn't actually have a plan, that the polls will close. Will it be enough for the Tories to stay in government? I'm not sure. But I don't think these MRP polls that say things like, oh, the Tories are going to have less than 100 seats when we've not even seen the manifestos yet can really be taken Look, seriously. Can I just say, uh, manifestos don't really matter. Unless there's a glaring problem in one of them, they don't matter. People don't read them. They're just about continuing the mood music. And what you see here, in the 90s, you had Black Wednesday. And after that, the Tories never recovered, and you had a result that actually will be a smaller landslide than we're expecting to see this time. And you had the same thing with Liz Truss's budget. It made people's minds up, and there's no evidence they've changed their minds since then. In fact, Rishi Sunak is polling worse than Liz Truss at the time she left office. And so people have made their minds up. The question is when they get the chance to exercise that right. Ah, now, uh, I will just say to one thing, I do read the manifestos. Mm. Uh, I do actually look them up online. Get a life, mm, mm, mm. I want to know what I'm voting for. Uh, but, Charlie, this brings us back to a question that I believe Helen asked us uh, in one of the previous uh, hours, uh, where she said about the political wilderness. So, let's say, for example, thought I experiment, that the Tories do lose, they get 98 seats. So, what do they do then? What can they do when they're in this wilderness? Yeah, well, it'll have to be a massive rebuilding project, obviously. If they've got that many seats, then they'll have to look very long and hard at themselves to look at their policies. And you will have to look at the manifestos, actually, to make sure whether the policies were right. But the manifestos do matter. If you look at the social care under Theresa May, that was Sorry, a disaster. Yeah. You know, so, very quickly, the two hardline Tories, I think you're just delusional. Like, 
you do not realise how bad it is. The country hates you. All right, OK. I think, actually, that Benjamin raises a very good point about the need for electoral reform. But, hey-ho. Still ahead, Andrew Doyle has a great show coming up at 9pm this evening. He'll be here to tell us about a woke row which has broken out a protest uh, at... Uh, uh, some protests, anyway. You're with the Saturday Five Live. <laughs> 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 GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. He's a genius. We know he's one of the few geniuses in the world. We have Mozart, we have perhaps Leonardo mm. da Vinci. He's mm. a genius. Of course he's worth, uh, they... worth, worth studying. <clears throat> but, Chris, did they not think that Ben Johnson wrote some of his works? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Some people say that. There's lots of, there's lots of people out there who, who will question who wrote the plays. What's really important, of course, it's the quality of the writing. And I, can I just add, I have some sympathy for my opponent in this debate because I'm afraid he's going to have to justify something which many people disagree with. But good luck to him. But I think we all know Shakespeare was well, a genius. I'm sure my <laughs> that's here from Ryan. Well. This is Ryan Mark Parsons, who's a former star of The Apprentice. Tell mm. us more, Ryan. Well, I agree with the other guests. I'm not denying Shakespeare's cultural relevance and significance in history. I mean, I admire Shakespeare. But I guess in terms of his relevance, if you were to define relevance, that, well, the Oxford Dictionary says it's appropriate to the time, context and circumstances. And I think there's an argument to be had about whether Shakespeare is relevant in 2024. Let's just look at the language that he uses. It's extremely archaic. It's almost elitist because you have to have studied his works in order to understand the plays in which he wrote. So I just want to tear my hair out when you say that. I mean, well, it's you know, true. he survives for 500 years and then the Gen Zers chuck it up the wall. And you say it's not relevant. Oh, he's more relevant than ever because what Shakespeare does is tells us about human nature. The human nature in the 16th century, wasn't it, or the 17th century, it was no different from today. You know, if you're looking at Vladimir Putin's headlines today, well, read Julius Caesar. It's just the language can be difficult, but that's good because we need to stretch children. We need to present children with things which challenge them. Don't always make life easier for children. Absolutely. No, make them stretch them a little bit. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to the Saturday Five. Your emails are coming in. Welcome along to Eileen. Come on, Eileen. <laughs> uh, she says, oh, my God, this is the first time I've watched Saturday Five. I'm thoroughly enjoying the programme. Now, Eileen, I have sent you five pounds in the poll. <laughs> Felicity says... I, right, this is getting silly now. Felicity says, I, I love the Saturday Five, I really do. Right-wing as I am, I admire Benjamin Butterworth's bravery and humour to wear that outfit. No, she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Representing alternative viewpoints. But week after week, just mm. one female panellist, two women per show, please, and sometimes three, to reflect the mix in the population. You're doing me out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a mortgage to buy! <laughs> uh, no need to go anywhere this evening, though, because Andrew Doyle has a great show coming up <laughs> at 9 o'clock. Good evening, Andrew. Andrew, we're really looking forward to the show. We've been discussing the marches through London today. I wonder, what's your take on them? Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? We've been we're going to be showing some footage of the marches from today later on in the show, and we'll be talking about the elements that appear on those marches that appear to be very openly anti-Semitic, uh, calling for support for the Houthi rebels, calling for support for Hamas, 
uh, this kind of really extreme behaviour. And I suppose the question is not so much uh, are these just rotten apples, you know, or is it that it's become normalised within the pro-Palestine movement and within the pro-Palestine marches? So we're going to be talking about that. But it's a very serious issue, isn't it, because it's happening every single weekend and a lot of people are, are, are getting sick and tired of it. But, Andrew, what do you think they ultimately want to achieve? Because they keep shouting on and on about a ceasefire, but David Cameron at the United Nations has just, well, demanded a ceasefire. Yeah, Surely I don't... that's it, isn't it? Well, I don't think they really know what it is they want to achieve. I mean, we know this because they often use that slogan, from the river to the sea, but if you actually try and pin them down what they mean by that, I mean, is it really feasible that you can have that entire territory from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean uh, entirely just composed of these two groups who ultimately will not get on? And I think a lot of it isn't thought through. We've seen this with the Queers for Palestine movement, who are very prominent at these displays. There was a protest in New York the other day where they were flying a, a joint flag of the Palestinian flag with the trans flag. Now, if they had any idea uh, of what goes on in the Arab world when it comes to gender and sexual orientation, uh, they would know that those things aren't compatible. So I think there's a lack of thought behind a lot of this movement. There's an awful lot of emotion and strength of feeling. And I can understand the strength of feeling insofar as no one wants to see civilians being killed. Yeah. I mean, that's absolutely horrific irrespective of where they are um, so we all sy sympathize with that I would have thought on a human level but when it when it comes to the the politics of this situation this very very delicate and difficult situation I'm concerned that a lot, of, a lot of the people on these marches haven't thought it through why for instance are there not open declarations of opposition to Hamas from the pro-Palestine movement given that Hamas are the worst thing ever to happen to the yeah. Palestinians why is that not happening indeed uh, what else have you got coming up then well we're also going to be talking about the BBC Michael Schellenberger who's an American journalist Oh, great. has yeah. been talking to a, uh, a former BBC journalist uh, about the problems within the organisation and specifically uh, related to the problems of gender uh, and the sort of censorship that goes on within the organisation. In other words, their claims to uh, being impartial aren't really all that strong. But we're also going to be talking about the Scottish Hate Crime Bill, which, as you probably know, is coming in on April the 1st, on April Fool's Day. Uh, it's a very, very draconian piece of legislation that's going to crack down on free speech. It's very worrying. Lots of people are worried about it. It, but it's been pushed through by Humza Youssef and the SNP anyway. Uh, and we're going to be talking a bit about that as well. Brilliant. Andrew, can't wait. Thank you very much as ever. We look forward to it. Now, panel, what have you enjoyed the most about our three hour extravaganza? <laughs> <laughs> I've enjoyed Apart from Andrew Doyle, of course. Charlie, I didn't enjoy discovering A, Charlie, and B, Charlie in a lion outfit. I insist that you post it on the GB News Twitter. It's the picture that you've all got to see. I'm sorry, yeah. Well, I will. Yes, Benjamin. Uh, Happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just keeps me being able to buy more jumpers. Um, that's my main reason for being here. All right. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, you'll cut uh, me off at the I jumper. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks very much to Diane, Spencer and Charlie Rowley for joining us for this three-hour extravaganza. And cheers to you at home. Carol says, nice to see Diane there causing mayhem. Is Benji OK? He looks way too mellow on his eyes. Look funny. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> next up, it's Andrew Doyle. I'll see you again next week. Warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Office. We're looking ahead for the rest of Easter. I think the best of the sunshine really is going to be reserved for more northern parts of the country. For the south, especially as we come into Easter Monday, it's looking very wet. So out there at the moment, we've still got low pressure in charge, and that's bringing in another band of heavy showers across more southwestern parts of the country. That will spread its way towards Northern Ireland as we end the night. Elsewhere, plenty of clear skies, so that's a perfect recipe for a fairly chilly night. A touch of frost across Scotland with some misty low cloud just beginning to move in across parts of the east. So we do start Easter Day off on a fairly sunny note across many centres central parts of the country. The cloud across the east will gradually just spread its way a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather grey afternoon to come with some spots of rain. Brighter further west and especially so for Scotland and Northern Ireland here, a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures in the sunshine reaching 14 or 15 degrees. Into Easter Monday, a pretty wet picture for a lot of England and Wales. Well, some of the rain will be quite heavy. Could turn brighter later on down towards the southwest, but the, again, the best of the brightness will be for Scotland and Northern Ireland with a mixture of sunny spells and showers. And unfortunately, the changeable theme does look like it will continue as we head into Tuesday and also Wednesday. Looks like things are heating up. 
Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. Serving police officers, showing that up to 20% of them are thinking about quitting the force and doing so within the next year or two. What on earth is going wrong? Problem, of course, is that those that go will be the experienced ones to be replaced by inexperienced ones. Kevin Hurley, former Detective Chief Superintendent at the Met Police, joins me from his home in Surrey. Kevin, this figure is shocking. The terms and conditions have really dropped off under Theresa May's what I would describe as an attack on the police service, where their pay has really dropped off, spending power down about 22% on what it once was. Worse still, the golden handcuffs, which were once the excellent police pension, have been taken away and the pension is now much reduced. The other mm. thing that's killing them is the cost.